pilot, pilot public engagement session. My name is Les Barkley, one of the Community Engagement Task Force members, and we would like to first acknowledge one Okay, well, first, acknowledge that we are on the traditional unceded territories of the Zinanangwil First Nations. Thank you, everyone, for taking some time out of your busy schedules to exercise some democratic skills. For democracy depends critically on how citizens engage with each other and with their elected representatives. Tonight is an opportunity to have a voice and to practice the important skills of dialogue, not monologue, and conversation and feedback, not blaming or argument. What we are doing through gatherings like this is building process and knowledge and building collaboration and value. In the end, it also builds community and strengthens government. You may be wondering, if you haven't attended before, what is the Community Engagement Task Force? We were formed last August as a result of a motion by Council with the intent to further community engagement and public conversation by the accommodation of four regularly scheduled open topic, facilitated dialogue in a setting distinct from Council's formal business meetings. The task force will produce a report on all this at the end of the four sessions, likely in 2019. The task force is comprised of nine people, myself, Ian Gartshore, Norm Smith, Robert Fuller, Nancy Mitchell, Peter Urquhart, Aaron Hemmers, Rosemary Sickord, and Bill Manners. We meet regularly, and our agendas and minutes are available on the city website, and anyone of the public is welcome to attend our meetings and ask questions. We are ably assisted by Tracy Lowens from the Communications Department and a Recording Secretary. I'll now pass on the baton to Ian to talk a little bit more about tonight's meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Les. So Les mentioned that we had an earlier session. It was a few months ago, and it was an open space technology, which is quite a different way of engaging than this one. Still tables, very interesting. And what we're trying to do is vary it up. We're all volunteers. We all have some experience in terms of engagement. And so what we're doing is volunteering our time, just like any of you are being here tonight, to try and create these events. This one has never been tried before. This is a town hall meeting, but with a real difference. We're calling it a micro town hall meeting, where as you can see, you're gonna have a much more intimate way of connecting with your elected official and with each other. Basically what we're trying to do is, is facilitate the opportunity for us to connect with our elected officials and we are looking forward to your feedback. There is a feedback form that you, hopefully you were given. We want to know, how did this work for you? We'll be having a third session in July. It'll be a nice summer day on a Saturday. I know it seems kind of hard to do that. We want to have a bit more time to get into either one or several issues. It'll be a different process again. We want to thank all the people that made this event possible. City Council and staff. I want to thank especially the councillors who have another event they could have gone to. And so I really am glad to see as many here. John McKay, our mayor, Diane Brennan, Carol Armstrong, Jerry Hong, Lord Fuller, Bill Bestwick, and Ian Fork are all here tonight. And let's say thank you for coming. We also have timers. Some of them I was able to to grab from Toastmasters in the groups locally. And so I want to thank the, those who were able to volunteer ahead of time, Bobby Taylor, Hajin Bay, Neresh Navula, and there are a number of others. Dorothy Houghton, who's never done this before. Yay, Dorothy, thank you. <laughs> and then there's some others who have volunteered to do this. Every table needs to have a table facilitator and a timer. I want to particularly say thank you to the table facilitators. They had no idea what they were really getting into when they agreed. And still don't. 
And so they are Abby Torium, Michael Giesbrack, Marjorie Stewart, Basha Hennock, Ben Giesbrack, and Larissa Koser. Thank you for coming and giving of your talent and skills. These are, these are awesome people. So let's thank them. Not leastly, thank you for coming on a beautiful evening. I don't, don't leave now, just because I said that. <laughs> on a beautiful evening, you could be walking with a dog or gardening or something like that. This is so important that you're here. We're really looking forward to seeing how this all comes out. So thank you for coming. And I'm now going to pass it on to our grand facilitator, our MC for this evening, Reed Botwright, who's going to give us the process. Great, thank you. All right. Welcome everyone, thanks for uh, coming out, um, and I'll just, essentially, I'm going to be the rule master here. I'll be trying to tell you guys all of the, uh, the uh, details of how we're going to um, facilitate this uh, moderated talk, and uh, really try to keep everyone on pace. I'll be, uh, warning you when things are ready to go to the next stage, and right now I'll give you a breakdown of all of those details. So uh, thanks again. Uh, my name is Reed Botwright. I work for the city in their IT department and somehow get roped into doing these all the time, but uh, I love it because people show up, great uh, conversations happen, and you get to see democracy at work. So uh, thanks for letting me be a part of this with you guys. Um, so yeah, thanks again to all the councillors. Great show up uh, here, uh, the mayor as well. And um, I just want to reinstate and emphasize the purpose of this event. And the purpose really is uh, to build relationships between citizens and elected officials, as well as to encourage engagement between citizens on the topics of their choosing. This is, uh, there were discussions about having specific topics for this uh, evening, but in the end, we thought, the, the, council, the committee thought it was much better suited to open it up and let you guys choose it in a controlled, moderated setting uh, so that your voices could be heard, uh, the, the councillors, our elected officials could engage in that discussion and um, everyone can kind of have that uh, intimate conversation about the real issues that impact all of us. Um, so, uh, as Ian mentioned, we're doing a micro town hall. Uh, we've been calling it a speed dating session internally for quite a bit because essentially that's what this is here. Um, so, everyone's seated, so that's great. Um, so, here's how it will work. Um, so. At every table, you're going to have one facilitator and one moderator, uh, or a timekeeper. The facilitator is the rules board. If things are getting out of hand, if they're getting a little too heated, they're the ones who will control the situation. Um, please respect what they have to say because they're here for that express purpose. Uh, they could be here as questioners, but they've devoted their time to really make this whole machine work. Uh, the timekeepers, because of this speed dating environment, they are going to be the ones that are keeping us on a schedule so that we can get through as many questions as possible so that everyone can kind of speed date with everyone else um, efficiently. So uh, each, um, each facilitator will ask one uh, of one of the, the questioners, um, what their question is, and then that questioner at the table uh, will have exactly one minute or less to get out all of the context and elaborate on exactly what they have to ask. And then the counselor, because we've got one at each table, will have exactly two minutes to answer that. And we've all got the timers, so we'll be keeping track of that. I'll be doing timing at the, uh, the Facebook live streaming table here. Uh, and then after the two minutes is up, we'll have five minutes for other people on the table, for the counselor and the question asker, maybe even the facilitator and the uh, committee members as they move around the room, to engage in a conversation about it. And then at the end of that eight minute period of time, 
the timekeeper will then ask, uh, will, you know, their alarm will go off, the facilitator will ask another question, and then so on and so forth. Slightly different format for the Facebook table here is we'll be actually taking some of those questions and timing them and whatnot from people uh, who are on Facebook watching us right now. Hi, Facebook. Um, so, uh, and I'll mention once the session is done, each session is probably going to be about 30 minutes long. We'll see how long uh, questions take to go. We'll be asking the counselors to stand up and then rotate around to one table. So you'll be able to speed date all of the question askers and the facilitators and the timekeepers can stay in their seats and then you'll get a chance with all of the uh, counselors. So, um, and uh, yeah, so we'll see how well and how quickly we get through these sessions. We've never done this before, I've never done this before, so it'll be a little bit of feeling out, but we'll probably take a break Around the end of the block, we've got uh, refreshments in the corner, bathrooms right out the door there, cookies and uh, coffee and whatnot. Um, and uh, we're hoping to wrap everything up around 9.15. Uh, we'll see how it goes, how quickly, if we run out of questions, if we just want to hang out. Uh, it, it'll be up to you guys. Um, and then uh, just some ground rules. So based on that, purpose of you guys connecting with each other, please be respectful for each other. For the counselors, you guys could be at the chamber luncheon or the chamber event that's going on right now. Um, or you could be outside just sitting in a lawn chair drinking mojitos. Like, this is your time. So everyone talking to the counselors, please be respectful of them and vice versa. We're all people here. Um, please allow everyone else an opportunity to speak. Uh, it's really important. So no talking or interrupting, talking over people, interrupting. Um, and really the most important part, the golden rule. Treat everyone as though you're in their shoes. How they want to be treated, do the same to them, unless you're a masochist. You know, Avoid that all <laughs> um, So let's get started here. That's that's really all I have here. Um, and uh, from a show of hands of timekeepers, are you guys all ready to go? Who's timekeeping here? You're the timekeeper over here. That's so what I was saying. Yeah. So just get the timekeepers in, in position. I asked if I could have okay. There it is. There's so my question. So does that mean if you're the timekeeper and you're the moderator um, that you cannot ask questions? No, I can ask questions. Yeah, exactly. uh, the so if people are live on Facebook and the three of us, can you ask if you're the moderator? Is that allowed? I, I didn't bring any questions. So am I the only one answering questions? Yeah. Yes, you're the okay. answer. You're the counselor, babe. Uh, yeah. 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 No, I'm good. I wasn't sure if it's probably could be looked at as sexy. So you shouldn't say that. One, go. All right. Who's going first? Okay, folks. Actually, I have a question. Actually, I think we should a real softball question for Jerry here. Uh, okay, sorry, sorry, Ray. Uh, no, actually, I was just going to say, being that it's the Facebook Live table, and and it is a community thing, we should probably see if there's anybody on Facebook and you can them. facilitate next time. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fred, you so how is that? How is that working with the Facebook <clears throat> Live questions? Is Anybody who's on Facebook right now watching right. the stream, and then we've got, we only have like three right now, but we're going to try and build momentum. Right. Okay. So we've got, okay. We actually had somebody comment, and right. comment already, just to say hello to everybody wow. here. I have an easy okay. question for Jared, just Go to get ahead. the ball rolling here. I was wondering if you can give us an update on the, uh, the hotel on Gordon Street. I definitely can. Um, city staff have received the building permit. If you go to what's building Nanaimo right now, uh -huh. you will see that they have actually applied for the building permit. All right. So that is the answer. So they are right. going ahead and I guess if they apply for a building permit, that means they've paid, right. they're not a builder, so they're, they're committed. How long do you think it'll take to build it? Um, they said that they're gonna have it done for next summer. 
Okay. Is what is that's the forecast. You know, we gave them till April the twentieth um, to come in, and they did come in on April the twentieth with the building permit. Okay. Excellent. So it is exactly on track at this point. Uh, we will take their word for it, or what Peg has to say, because so far they've been great. <laughs> Anything more supplementary, Chris? Do well, I have a supplementary? Um, no, that? those are the only two I had. We'll just let, the one. We'll let them right. And then do we want to <laughs> open it up to greater discussion amongst the rest? Okay, Rick. Um, what is the uh, room total? And how um, high will it be? It's going to be nine floors, okay. from what I um, understood. And I think they're pushing, if I recall, 150 rooms. Oh, nice. Yes. So there was a bit lower before. Um, they were going to go with the wood frame. But they've decided that with the demand and the NIMO needs for hotel rooms, they're going to go with a concrete structure okay. and then go up to nine floors. Nice. Yes. And did they give some sort of estimation or is that even in the plans right now about what the jobs would come from this? Um, I'm not sure, but I know that the building is a $22 million project okay. for the city of NIMO. So that's what it is. Um, that's what the city of Nanaimo will make 22 million? No, that's what their the, the cost of the construction is oh, for them. Okay. It's a 22 okay. million dollar building. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jerry, for very succinct, full marks for succinct uh, <laughs> answers and not, not using a lot of our time. Yeah. I think yeah. we could go to one of the Facebook yeah, uh, questions now. Okay. I have one. Um, what measures by the city are currently underway to improve the food security of all residents of Nanaimo? Oh, that would be my question. Yes, a very good question. <laughs> Sorry to steal it. Yes, <laughs> no problem. So, as you as you know, um, Bevan Park Master Plan is coming forward with with how uh, we've uh, donated some of the land to Nanaimo. Um, farmers market where the old tennis courts used to be so they've taken over that space the market is coming along um, we're waiting for for them to come together to, about their building because they wanted an indoor space that's happening we've had interest from the community with regards to the five acres um, in Harewood that they're looking at buying right, so that right. is on the list of our projects that the council is discussing on what we were doing with our capital projects and and property acquisition is, is the key that we have you know we have those um, we've spent a lot of money I know it's not related to food but we've spent money on buying um, Rotary Roll Soraxman Stadium we've committed to convert the rest of the Colliery Dams and the Greater Water District lands as park. Um, you know, we have residents that are interested in wanting us to buy the rest of Lindley Valley. Okay. This is just the right. first minute, so oh. you've got, you got no I had no idea. He held up the card, and <laughs> I but thought that was... Green, yeah. green is good, red is Green over. means go. <laughs> okay, so yellow is wonderful. Hot, I so, see, oh, it's like the lights. One of yeah. the issues that comes up with food security is transportation. Mm -hmm. And one of the good things about the farmer's market is that it's held here at Devon Park, yes. isn't it? which is right on a bus route. But are there any other ways in which the city can improve transportation to make it easier for people who don't have private vehicles? Very good question. Um, with regard to transit, as we know, that's a regional district function, but you know we do sit on that. So we've been given 5,000 more bus hours um, for the southern Vancouver Island. So that's you know Cedar is interested in some of the hours. As you heard, staff wanted to go to Duke Point, but the committee turned that down because we saw a more need for better bus service within the, the, the infrastructure that we have right now before expanding it out too far to, to the Duke Point because it wasn't, um, from what they gathered, was important. So now they're on community sessions um, with South Nanaimo. Um, so that's the 5,000 hours, which is Nanaimo, Cinnabar, and, and, and Cedar and, and, and those areas to discuss what they're going to do with the 5,000 hours. So that is going to improve transit, um, improve connections, um, to these routes as well. Thank you, Jerry. Anybody else at the table have another question yet? Oh, or, or discussion, discussion on further discussion, discussion, sorry, the transportation or any other? Well, I do. Yes, of course. <laughs> and far away. Yeah, he is subject to yes. do with transportation. So if we're just going to stay focusing on transit right now, which, you know, there's lots of different transportation issues, mm -hmm. but if we focus on that, if, if we supplement more transportation in the city itself, which I don't know how the RDN feels about us outstanding most of the extra hours rather than see We pay for it. So whoever is taking the hours is pretty much paying for the bill. Okay. Right. That's handy. So, and like I said, um, area 
C, which was Jingle Pot. As you know, the bus goes through Jingle Pot, but they opted out of the program. So no bus service stops in, in Area C. Right. Even though we drive by it, they just don't want to pay. So the city of Nanaimo had to take on their hours as well. So it just drives through, but there's, there's no, no, no stopping in yes. Area C. And it doesn't even... Express. Yeah. Uh, no, there's a slow one too, the Jingle Pot one. There's two of them, right? There's the Express of the Highway, and then there's one that goes all the way along Jingle Pot, but part of Jingle Pot is Area C, and it doesn't. there's no bus stops in that area. Does it operate as a rural route where you can flag down a bus? No. No, it's a long well, if they're not going to pay, they're short. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And, so, and that was okay. and that was one of the discussions back on to Duke Point is Nanaimo would have had to pay again most of it, but when you have a ferry service that benefits everybody in the entire region, not just the city of Nanaimo area, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, Parksville, Qualicum. Now you can get to Duke Point, but they weren't interested in paying their share. So the numbers for them to come out for us to, to bear that cost of the transportation to get everybody off the island should be only fair that everybody pays into it. Okay. Fair enough. Do we have another one? Well, oh, I keep on going here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a discussion which, yeah. which lasts up to five minutes okay. in our model. Okay. And so I'm going to do three, four, and five okay. minutes is what this is <laughs> okay. going to be here. And right now we're at two, so Sounds we're doing good. all right. Now I have to think of my question again. <laughs> Ginger hats. Yeah. So if more of the hours are going to be in Nanaimo, and of course they haven't figured out where those hours are going to be, this is an idea that I keep on hearing, and of course you're not a transit planner, no. I get that, you're a city council. No, but I am on the committee. Are you? Yes. Okay. So one of the, the things that keeps on coming up, I'm hearing from Joe Public, or Joe Public or whatever, is could there be express buses running up and down yes. the spine. There is currently one mm -hmm. for the express, although the university has a, a pretty good one as well. And then have smaller buses that would loop in and, and connect with those express buses. That has been my idea and that's what I've been hoping that they would do. But the problem that we have is we don't own the buses. BC Transit owns the buses and they lease the buses to us. So we don't have a choice. When we say we want a small bus, <clears throat> We don't have that choice. It's what BC Transit gives us, which are these big buses. So we're limited to what we can do. And again, with your idea, and I think it's a phenomenal idea, and I think that's the way it should be because of the fact that we all know it takes over an hour and a half from Woodgrove to get downtown. And if you had an express route that can just do the loops, um, it, it would be phenomenal. But we can only work because I said it's not our program. It is with RDN and it's also with BC Transit, so so it's it's different. Now I've heard just to add to that that BC Transit tends to do a lot of the designing of and the guy is in Victoria apparently. So is there a way that the city and the region could say, we have some ideas and we want to have a bit more say in terms of size of buses, in terms of how the routes are scheduled? Is that a possibility? Yes, we, we have this we have the scheduling abilities, which we do, um, because we've adjusted some of the buses for, for some of the high schools and stuff like that. So we just have to do that in September for the following year. So we have that ability. But in the terms of buses, we don't have any say that we want a smaller bus. We don't have that ability whatsoever. BC Transit has whatever they buy from whoever they buy from is in that list. If you put just on that, Matt and Matt, 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 um, I should probably have asked the moderator before I just budged in. <laughs> on that, if you put a plan to BC uh, Transit with the same sort of you know feeder buses, because North Vancouver does that, uh, if you put that kind of a plan to BC Transit, could you then sort of petition them? For smaller yep. buses, would that um, would it be left on deaf ears or? Yes, because like I said, BC Transit buys not just for for Nanaimo. They okay. buy for all of BC. So when they buy buses, they buy bulk buses. Yeah. And we're expecting some smaller buses. I think they're looking into that. 
it is not yet. Okay. So that's it. So that's the idea is that we get into a conversation, we can talk with each other, not okay. just simply yeah. with, the, with the counselor. So that's the idea of the five. No, only one. talking this way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and okay. you don't have to have my permit. Okay. I'll just intervene if there's any. Yeah. So, okay. All right. So uh, another question. Of yeah, I have another one here from Facebook, and this one isn't a softball one. Uh, this one <laughs> is um, wanting you to speak to the expenditure for the hometown hockey visit and why it um, went way over what a traditional city spends on the same event. Okay, so um, I wasn't on the committee, but we did get the budget. So some of the things that happened that we saw that no other community did was we had fireworks. We already know off the bat that that's thirty to fifty thousand dollars in firework costs. Okay. Just off the bat, it's not cheap. When we did excursions to Newcastle, having the work news with Sanemo First Nations and and the feast and all of that event to bring the First Nations to showcase that that wasn't free. So these were all these extra things that weren't done um, in other hometown events. We've left, you know, we put the money into the zip line, which wasn't used this year, but because we didn't hire the company as a contract to make sure that they were coming back so they didn't know that this is going to be off. So the infrastructure is there. We moved docks that we bought for Brecken and that was expensive to put it down there for that event and for that year in case anybody else needed to use it. So there were a lot of things that we were doing that it wasn't just the hometown hockey related. So there was a whole bunch of other things that we added to it that were projects that we kind of amalgamated into one situation. Like these docks, some of them are going to Divers Lake, the other ones are going to um, Colliery Dam. The majority of them have already gone to Brecken Boat Ramp. So, you know, instead of doing these projects, since we had them, we thought it would be great to have all these other things to make that event. Um, but where's the rink right now? So we have, Public Works has the rink, um, the tarp, right? Right, yeah. That so now the next thing to do is, is to put it up. And one of the things that we talked about was having it this coming up year, if anything, or the following, for um, Barsby. Because now we've actually built the enclosed, the covered space for the cross box. And that would fit in there perfectly because, as we know, it has to be enclosed to, to keep the ice frozen. Um, and, and to those options, you know, we looked at Danacraw Plaza, um, right? You can't do it there because of weights and, and, and some of the other stuff because you have a parkade underneath there in, in yeah. certain areas. So that's what they're looking at, at doing as well. Does that just a discussion? Yeah. Can I segue off just for a moment? Sure. Because of the, I remember you saying in a, a meeting one time about Diana Crawl and, and what, there was a reason why there couldn't be uh, food trucks on it. And does it need to be uh, fixed or looked at or rem is it called remedied? 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as we all know, the Ancrawl Plaza sits on top of the parkade. Yes. Right. So there are some soft spots in not structurally, like structurally soft spots, not faulty mm -hmm. because of the fact that it spans in some of these areas. So what needs to be done is either the parkade needs to have some more support in, in, in holding up so that the weight can be helped okay. on, on that. So And as you also know, we actually don't own all of Diana Crawl Space because the city a couple years ago sold off the airspace to Insight Properties. So they sold the off the air, space? yes, they sold off the air parcel. So How we own. sell the air <laughs> Oh, no, no problem, I can help you. So <laughs> you sell everything above above the ground that you sit on. So that's the airspace. Well, all right. Yes. Because you have to have a certain amount of space for every foot because you want to have some clearance around that. Yeah. And so they got to go higher because they got space. Um, well, yeah, they, they bought it because it actually sits on top of, of the parking lot. But then they can build on top of that, and then they get the space. So they so pretty they can much go up vertically. Yes. So they, they we own the land below the concrete, and then they own the land above the concrete. So we actually don't own all of that, and that was before my time okay. that they was bought it. So, and as we city staff have a report that because of how old it, it's going to need to be redone, mm -hmm. um, because as you know, it's all pave, paving stones. Yes. So paving stones with what's the lining underneath only has a certain life expectancy and. We've had it for 10 years already. Is there a dollar amount on what would need to be fixed? Um, Have you guys at the city done that? There's reports that hasn't come before us for a budget um, to, to talk about it. You know, that is in the mind. 
So I want to inject, interject from Facebook. This is coming yeah. from Facebook. Uh, there's a person here who was asking, I'm going to combine both their things. They were asking about justifying the cost of hometown hockey and how much was spent. And it sounds like you did some of that yes. earlier. And they were asking what measurable economic benefits has Denaibo received from the $300,000 spent on the hometown hockey. Can council qualify these economic benefits? Yeah. So again, some of the benefits that we have, like, again, what I'll say is the docks. So the economic benefits now when we expand Brecken is all the fishing people that are coming to use that. If you've ever been down there in the summertime, it's busy. You can't park your trailer, your boat. So adding that space um, is going to have better for that. So we're going to be a lot more viable for people that love fishing and that want to launch with the Breck, with, with the canoes and everything. We have the zip line. Um, the economic benefit of that was for some of the organizations that did it for volunteer that raised money for them. Um, during bathtubs, if silly boats, if dragon boats wanted to use that, the infrastructure is there. So you're adding a facility or a piece of a facility that is going to be there forever um, at Mafail Sutton Park that other organizations can use to enhance their event. So that in turn they will increase the benefits for, for actual measurables. Um, it looks like the timing for most of the tables is kind of up and down. Um, so don't worry so much about getting your tickets to time. It looks like a lot of really good conversations are coming out of this place on the Facebook table or some of the others I've heard. Um, and I'll just give you guys, uh, since it seems like we're getting through quite a bit of uh, questions, give you guys about five more minutes, maybe one or two more questions, and then we'll start a rotation of the counselors to the next table. Okay, so okay. five minutes. But let's go with another question that came in really earlier from yep. Facebook here. Uh, what, and it's, that one was a fun one. What is the city going to do about the homeless and crime and drug use downtown? Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. Again, that, that comes, yeah. you know, only get five and we minutes. need a lot of help in that from all levels of government. Like I said, yeah. I think we're, people are doing the best they can, um, merchants as well in the downtown, residents and, and the city. Um, I think it's going to have to be a partnership. The only thing way that we're going to get past this is all working together where VHA steps up, not to increase enforcement, but to have increased their presence and having more people on the street. You know, we can put as many security guards and RCMP as we want on the street, but they're not trained. You know, they, they don't know how to deal with, with these situations because they're not trained in that, in that case. You know, we can do optically what we're doing is making it look safe, but I don't think it's helping any. Um, you know, it could look safe, we're moving along, but that's not what we need to do. We need help from BHA and the provincial government. You know, not just in housing, because you talk about housing, you house them, but they're gonna still openly do drugs and everything. They still have to come out, they still need the money. I talked to VHA, I've got a few people at VHA, um, and they're saying that, you know, they have the outreach workers, and they're saying that the, outreach, the amount of outreach they have is adequate. And I dispute that. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think they could use, you could use a, quite a bit more outreach workers for that. The other big thing, um, to, uh, someone was actually uh, questioning me on Facebook today about about being so critical and not being um, um, positive, gratitude and, 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 and congratulating. And I said, well, two things I congratulated was uh, was on the hotel, which we already talked about, and the other thing was the uh, the drop-in center where you guys, have, where Mayor and Council, have committed up to a hundred thousand yeah. dollars for for a drop-in center, and that is excellent. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's... And needed. Yes. Agreed. Who owns the Franklin Street gym? Um, that is... Sanemo First... Sanemo First Nations. I know it's their safe zone. I don't know if it's it, Sanemo, it, it's, or I think it's... It's, it's Telecom. I think it's Telecom. It's House. used for a, a, a neutral place program, yes. but who owns it? Um, I think it's the school district. Mm -hmm. And... And I think Tilikum is it runs it. I don't think it's the name. I think See, it's that, Tilikum. See, that's a huge facility. Yes. I've used that facility, and it's two major gymnasia spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I were on council, I might be asking questions about how effectively that space is being used and whether the people who are currently using it have more potential uses for it. Yeah. Uh, with this 
uh, daytime homeless center that yes. you guys are putting money to. Have you also created partnerships with VHA for services to be in that building as well? Because you were you started to speak about how services are even more as important if not well I don't know want to put them on one I want to put them equally yeah. as housing and so we need you in order for uh, the homeless to have uh, it needs to be there yes. yeah, I'm sorry my mind is like no no and I, and, I, and, I, and I understand <laughs> you know what, what I mean yes. right yeah um, and that was our hope when we put our, the money forward, I think we were the first to say, you know what, Yeehaw, you know what, provincial government, we're putting money, we're, we're committed. We, we want to help, so now it's up to you guys to step up. So that was the first step. Now it's now we leave it with staff so they can discuss with Yeehaw because we want to also find a mutually agreeable place that, that works for everybody as well, right? So. Yeah. Now that we have this and we've committed money to it, now staff have the ability to, to move it to the next step and get commitments from the John Howard Society, from you know all these other organizations, the VHA, and maybe a school and VIU and the nursing program and all these others. But when you don't have any money, you don't have anything put aside to it, it makes it difficult. Mm -hmm. So, and I think, you know, money is commitment. Have you guys found a building? No, not yet. We leave it up to staff hands okay. and then they just come to us. We, you know, and then that's what okay. we wait for. Okay, yeah. but you guys are waiting for a building right now? I heard that there was a timeline that by July, a building, like it would be up and going. Is that... That's rumor. Well, or? that is it's very easy, it's very possible, right? Okay. So, you know, we're not buying a building by any means. We'll, no, I don't we'll think we'll be leasing yeah. a building, and so you just got to find some vacant space and, and finding an area that's going to work. But before we do that, it's very important that we try to, you know, communicate with the area that we're going to put this in to ensure that it, it doesn't disrupt them. And that's what we're hearing yeah. from the merchants And what downtown. Mayor McKay was adamant about in the discussion was that he wanted a choice, and you guys had a really good debate, real good discussion. Um, motions were put forth, and and everyone was uh, happy with uh, Mayor McKay's um, request for yep. a future, a few, a few options. Yeah, not just one option. They were, Mayor McKay wanted. A few. Here's another yeah. question. What's the city's responsibility to the downtown library branch? Because they're taking a lot of the burden of yes. people who have nothing to do during the day. Yeah, yes. and, and, and and it's it's a huge problem. I know that we we do the library budget as well, and, and, and they're seeing challenges with it, and I think um, it's because with the Diana Cross space. The Port Theatre is also seeing challenges um, with, with the people in the back as well. So, And I think what we need to do is have more programming. Um, when yeah. the library had their um, anime thing there, there were there were lots of people moving in and out, and I think we just need more programming downtown. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very so we got the first round. How yeah. did that go? Oh, good. You yeah, did that really well. well. Thank very you. good. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Did we get well. any more questions coming in? No, no you have to go to another table. No, no, I, just, no, I wasn't sure <laughs> about the Facebook one. Yeah, was good. That, you did really Jerry well. Jerry doesn't want to leave. Well, this one's easy, yeah. <laughs> No, no problem. No, no we'll, we'll have a new group coming. <laughs> yes. But there, there are some really interesting issues. Does the city actually deal with the Nanaimo for Housing Society? To understand how many of uh, people in need of housing they're All right. looking for? So yeah. Ian's looking at the and John where he's Horn going. Now, and 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 the previous year, the biggest problem was he was the only one. Yes, he do. That's right. We have those he do. Do we have more now? Yes, we do. Yes. How many? Now we, he's got... Here comes uh, the third you know. part of them. Yeah. Nice. The yeah. Third. <laughs> well, Karen, Karen Constell is the next one, but yeah. they also have some other help Good. with yes. it as well. Thank so, you. That table needs Thank somebody. You. Okay. There, you're going to come over here. Let me grab my coffee. <laughs> Oops. All right. Hello, Hello Marjorie. Ian. Oh. Hello, Fred. Mr. Ian. Thor. Ray. How you doing? What are you doing oh, here at the media table? <laughs> 
Should I say why? why? I'm, I'm here for my bed. I'm here for Marjorie Stewart. It's a bonus that I get to do the Facebook Live as well, but um, my real reasoning is because I admire this woman and I wanted to be at a table that she was moderating. I, I admire be good. Too, man. <laughs> and now I I'm the meat of an Ian sandwich here. Look at it. Uh, oh, isn't that? <laughs> Well, welcome to uh, <laughs> and, uh, Ian is you. fine. But thank, thank you, you, Ian, for bringing what you've learned. How many terms have you done? This is like this is my. One. It does seem like a long time. It's my first term, yeah. so three and a half years into a four-year term. Okay. So, have we got questions piling up out there in cyberspace? <clears throat> no, not yet. Just the ones from the previous session, so we can start with one of those. Um, I'll give you maybe a chance to speak on the very last one that we came up with. Was a early on concern about what the city is going to do about homeless, uh, crime, and drug use downtown. Okay, let's start with an easy one, shall we? <laughs> no, no, no. Hey, it's not Facebook Live for nothing. No, that's right. So, so obviously, homelessness, crime. What was the other one? Uh, so, drug use. Homeless, drug use. Crime, the drug. Yeah, all, all unfortunately related, and all a very, a very big concern right now with the citizens of Nanaimo, I think. And it's not. I guess I need to say first, it's not an easy, simple fix, but. Council has been made very aware of the concerns of our downtown merchants, mm -hmm. of our residents who uh, go to shop downtown, and, and of the image of our city when visitors come to our downtown area especially. So how can we address this? Well, we can address it by trying to encourage uh, an increase in low rental housing or affordable housing in whatever form that might take. We can address it by trying to uh, have more enforcement, uh, bylaw enforcement downtown of uh, behaviors that, that are threatening to our citizens, and by also providing some type of supportive treatment for drug users who are looking to break out of that cycle of addiction. And for me, that's the important part. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, are we timing here? Or? You're halfway there. Keep okay, going. okay. Um, <laughs> we'll let you because, know. Because it's not just a case of providing a place for people to, to, to get um, drugs or to be able to safely inject. Uh, to me, what's important is to also provide education for those people who want to stop having to take the drugs, who want to, to get off the street, who want to find a place to live and, and improve their lives. Mm -hmm. And I think if we have a drug in what we call a drug and safe injection site that has to be incorporated with education and counseling to help those people improve their yes. life. Yes. Okay. So it's a huge topic. Yes. Further discussion? Oh, I'll go for it. Sure. Um, it seems to me that there are various types of affordable housing mm -hmm. provided and a lot of people who have opinions about getting the people off the street don't seem to understand all the different kinds of affordable housing that people are operating in the community. So I wonder if you could take a couple of minutes and uh, express what you know about some of the places that are already sure. offering affordable housing and housing with services. Yes, thanks Marjorie. So you're right, there, there is a real continuum of housing uh, that we want to try and provide. And the best examples that I can point to of supportive housing uh, are the um, units that have been built on Uplands Drive. I think it's called Uplands Drive. And there's also one just across from the hospital, uh, in the hospital area, and there's a third one whose location eludes me right now. I, I think yeah, you might be right. One, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Wallace Street is hard to house people. Yes, yes. 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 Yeah, there's one on my So those facilities have 24-7 uh, monitoring and support for people that uh, are trying to trying to break their addiction cycle. And uh, that was also, I think, the intent of the most recent proposal uh, in Chase River. Okay. Yes. And, and that was a hot topic at Council, and we had an opportunity to create uh, another building there. We chose not to take that opportunity simply because, and I agreed, that I did not think the location was suitable. 
uh, being right across the road from a boys and girls club and basically a block away from an elementary school. So very reluctantly I did not support that one, but we're hoping that we can find another location and get the provincial government to say, okay, we'll fund you for that. So that's one aspect of the continuum, that, continuum Marjorie, that you asked about. Uh, another thing that's just come before Council uh, that citizens might not be aware of is uh, Habitat for Humanity. And they have just come to Council with a proposal for a new uh, pod of, I believe, 12 homes in South Nanaimo. Uh, they've asked for city support in terms of supplying land. Uh, Habitat builds the houses to get people into their own home for the first time, uh, low rental, but they actually own the home, they have a mortgage, uh, and they can, they can start life as a homeowner. So that's further up the continuum of housing. Uh, so the city's role to me largely is in terms of supplying land and opportunity. And the provincial government, I have to say, I think is really taking this issue seriously and is looking at helping communities provide housing. So could I jump in with something? And that is tiny homes. Yes. There yes. used to be a builder yes. in South Nanaimo who built them. And Nanaimo, this is before your time as a councillor, they, the council said no, the minimum size square footage has to be X, Y, and Z, and that's the square footage of the property or mm -hmm. meters, square <coughs> cubic meters. I know of people that would love to live in a tiny home. Mm -hmm. They would just give them some place to live, and then if they could have that on a bigger piece of property, say, a, say an acre or something like that, if they could do that, then it would be affordable for them. They could afford the mortgage <coughs> of something like that. But I don't know where the city's at in terms of that possibility. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, Ian, because that's a really interesting, fairly new uh, creative solution. And, and smaller homes, tiny homes, call it what you will, is something that I think our planners are starting to look at in terms of bylaw and uh, lot size. And again, it's finding the land to allow that to happen, but it's certainly something we're open to looking at. Um, and there was something else that crossed my mind that I wanted to mention too, but it'll, it'll come back to me. The city actually owns a certain amount of land and tries to make best use of it, doesn't it? The city has a land acquisition um, reserve. Uh, there's not a lot of money in it, uh, but yes, and, and the, the intent is to acquire land for certain purposes as we look ahead. Uh, and certainly housing now has become one of the reasons that we look to acquire land, absolutely. And there's other reasons like parkland and so on, but yes, we do have a we do have a reserve for that. So further discussion, uh, further questions? No, oh, I got a question. But go you ahead. can go on Facebook go if you want. Uh, I'd like to know what the um, uh, thoughts are surrounding trying to bring down the taxes to 2.0 instead of leaving it at 3. I did listen to mm -hmm. the meeting, but um, is there really there was some numbers thrown out about for some positions here, some positions which would bring it down at like 0.12%. Uh, is that really viable to bring it down? Uh, and I don't know whether you want to speak as a council as whole or as an individual councillor. E either one is good for me. Well, I think I can only speak as an individual, Ray, and I'm happy to do that. So uh, as probably everybody knows, the, the vote... Uh, uh, last Monday night was five to four to not accept the proposed budget, which was 3.01 percent yes. tax increase. Yeah. Um, I was very disappointed in that decision. I was prepared to accept the budget of uh, a three percent tax increase because I thought it was reasonable. Uh, we had asked staff to prepare a budget based on the capital projects that we have in hand and the services that we supply to the citizens of Nanaimo. Figure out basically what those cost and break it down into how much per household we need mm -hmm. to, right. to supply those things. Mm -hmm. The answer came back 3.01%. Um, so I thought that was reasonable and over the past four months there had been no discussion at the council table that anybody was really unhappy with that or wished to see it reduced down to 2%. What about at the Finance Committee? Was there any discussion there? There was nothing, there were no suggestions or 
or complaints that been, I can recall of. This has been brought forth since like November yes. of last year. Am I correct in that? Yes. Okay. That's right. No discussion. No discussion. There has certainly been discussion of the budget. There had been opportunities for uh, for input and mm -hmm. and alternate direction to staff. To my recollection, there had been nothing. Yeah. So it came as a surprise to me last Monday night when all of a sudden uh, people were unhappy with on council were unhappy with the 3.01 percent and wanted to make it 2.5 and then somebody said two percent yeah. and it was like we were pulling numbers out of the air yeah. so to me uh, although nobody likes increased taxes uh, to me to continue to supply the services that we need to our city and to keep our projects moving ahead we needed a budget of 3.01 percent mm -hmm. uh, to to eliminate a couple of uh, staff, potential staff positions will save us a little bit of money, but nowhere in the neighborhood of what would be needed to bring yeah. that down to two percent. I can only see services being cut with that. Uh, yeah, you're you bringing down a whole, a whole percentage, percentage point. That means services um, are going to be cut. Well, oh. just as like Diane Brennan said, tax those kind of things don't help the poor. So when you're thinking that you have to bring a whole percentage point down, there are going to be services that need to be cut and those usually affect the poor more than they affect everybody else. So uh, that kind of, a, that's a huge, 1% is a huge increase. It is. I mean, it is it, it, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot. And that is my fear that we're, we are going to affect services or projects. Fred has something to say. Yes. No, oh, um, went away? <laughs> no, no, when, um, actually when the process started, it was on December 19th when they had the press and you and I were there and there was someone else. Was it the 19th? I thought it was, I thought it was in November. No, it was, it was, it was pretty close to Christmas. Okay. So anyways, okay. what happened was, but yeah, and we were both there. Tracy, Tracy said the reason they were having it so early is they wanted to have there be no surprises. It could be well debated. Mm -hmm. Everybody, it'll be well debated and there'll be no surprises and we'll be able to, to get it in um, before time, May, yeah. May 15th, no problem. Mm -hmm. I remember that. It was no surprises. It wasn't well, here debated we much at the council table, it sounds like. Ian, did you have a comment on that topic? I think you've made a really good point, Ian, and that is that if we cut it's going to end up hurting the very people that we're trying to help. So it seems to me if we cut, let's, I'm just going to arbitrarily say, okay, we're not going to have as many bus hours, or we're not going to put as much money into helping the homeless, or we're going to cut uh, the, the tours downtown where we're trying to help out uh, and move people along. If we're going to cut some of the supports that are in place, for example, uh, low-cost uh, swimming, for mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. with lower income. So if you cut any of those kinds of things, and sooner or later those are going to get hit, then we're going to end up with more problem in the back end where we're going to have more people, merchants downtown complaining, and yeah. we're going to end up with more issues down yeah. the road. So does this really help the city or us? So so I, I tend to, I definitely agree, Ian, and, and you know, it ties into the earlier question and, and topic, and that is the issues of homelessness and providing housing and social disorder. Um, and to fix those things or to try and fix them takes dollars. And, and we just increased uh, funding to try and uh, uh, do more for the downtown merchants and address some of those issues. But it all takes money. If we want to acquire land for low-cost housing, that takes money. Um, people want us to buy the A&B Sound building to improve downtown. People want us to buy the Jane Burns building. That was people, my next question. People want us, people, we'll get there. People want us to buy uh, another piece of Linley Valley, and those are all great ideas, but it all takes money. And unfortunately, most of that money comes from taxation. Yeah. A little supplemental there. Are there any uh, contingency funds that could be drawn on to fill the gap? Yes, there are, and that's a really good point, Marjorie, and I think that's the argument that some would make on Council, that we do have reserves uh, which are specific to certain areas. Uh, any surplus goes into uh, reserves. We could we could draw on those. Read, read, read. Yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, we could draw on those. So we but could, then you'd have them depleted. We could deplete our reserves uh, to, to top up for this year. 
but then you're faced with having to replenish those reserves next year and probably at a higher tax rate. And what if we have a big snowfall? Exactly. Right. Yeah. So you can't predict, will we have a bigger surplus next year or, or not? It's really difficult to predict. And didn't, Ms., is it Ms. or Mrs. Mercer, the head of finance right now, mm -hmm. um, our acting head of finance, yes. did she right. not say at the meeting on Monday night that to borrow from either general revenue or the other, I can't remember offhand what the other one was called, but either one will cause you distress and it's not really a good practice to start to do. That was her recommendation. Yeah. And I certainly respect her expertise. So well, from all I've heard, she's really good too. So that was five minute discussion, five and a half. We have more from Facebook here. Um, so I do want to say that anybody on Facebook, first of all, that can hear me, if you have a question, feel free to ask it, feel free to involve yourself in the conversation. Um, otherwise, we're going to fill the space. Um, one thing coming in is, I'm just going to read it here. Thanks for your service, Councillor Thorpe. Uh, does the city, does count, yeah, does council and city staff have the capacity to provide in a timely manner another supportive housing site or sites if and when the province or federal government makes funding available again? All right, so um, I think I can answer that fairly simply. When the Chase River site was uh, turned down by council, we directed staff to bring us a list of all city-owned properties and in fact all privately owned properties that were on the market that we could potentially use as an alternate location. Right. Uh, that list came back to us. All of the or any of the potential alternate sites would have required rezoning, servicing, and it would have been a lengthy process to get those ready uh, to put a shovel in the ground for the provincial initiative. So is there anything available right now that we could use? No. Uh, are there some potential sites for future? Yes. And we are looking at those. And again, that comes down to what I was discussing before, and that is property acquisition. So we do own some sites. There's others that are out there that might be, uh, might be usable, but it might involve the city purchasing them and then dealing with the zoning, dealing with the servicing. So um, there may be some sites that would be very costly in terms of remediation. It's possible, Marjorie. That's all. That's always a consideration. Yes. If, so if you're dealing with with uh, any site remediation, yeah. yes. you never you never get away free. And then I'm always never noted for <laughs> land banking for some reason. It's you know it's something that I've come to appreciate, and and I really think I would. Ideally, I would like to see us be able to put more money into our land acquisition uh, reserve. I think we have something like, and I could be wrong here, 2.3 million, uh, but that, to be honest, doesn't go very far. No. And, and if we were asked, just as an example, to purchase another chunk of Lindley Valley, that would, that would probably eat it up and, and then some. Yeah. So it's not a lot. And, and there's a lot of uses that we could have for land to improve our city, mm -hmm. whether it's downtown or on the, on the outskirts for housing or whatever. Do you folks have questions? I, I could ask you like a supplement to that. Sure. You know, the newly minted SIRF, uh, is that S-I-R-F? Am I saying the acronyms? Fund that was just newly built or created for uh, strategic infrastructure funds. Oh yes. Is, am I saying the right acronyms? Is it um, S I R F? I haven't heard of it referred to by that, but anyway, I know okay. what you mean. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I might have. There's to, so many acronyms I lose yeah, count. Yeah, no doubt. But that fund hasn't really been used for anything, and it was kind of, from what I re recall, it was just. Uh, introduced in order to build big projects, mm -hmm. right? Uh, as a municipality, building big projects is not really something in the mandate for a municipality. Sure, it is a lovely thing to have such thing as a legacy product or project, but it's not really uh, 
what a municipality responsibility is for. Could you not take the money from that and put it into land acquisition and just cancel that fund out and then you'd have more money to buy land? If that was the will of council, we could probably move money around and I could stand to be corrected here. Uh, I, uh, my recollection is that particular fund was created with the intent of the event centre. Yes. Um, what we do have, and something that I really strongly agree with, is our um, asset management reserve fund. I agree with that too. Uh, so that when we talk about a 3.01% tax increase, 1% of that goes automatically towards asset management reserves. The pipes that are in the ground, they're all getting older, and we really do need to budget for that repair. Yes, we do, yeah. I think that's very important. Yes. How long was that? I'm not Five sure minutes. which, yeah. what fund yeah. would, there would both benefit, mm -hmm. so you could take like half of that and like just totally get rid of it because the event center, hopefully the Nanaimo has told council how they feel about it, so why do we need that fund anymore? Could it not be just, has anybody brought it to and the And that's table? something that I would certainly have to ask Ms. Mercer or our, okay. our financial department about. Um, not forgetting that we do have smaller projects that are happening mm -hmm. and, and very exciting ones. And I'm thinking of uh, um, in Harewood, the covered uh, multi-sport facility, which mm -hmm. is uh, right just about to officially open. Right behind my house. <laughs> just, be, <laughs> just behind uh, John Barsby School. Yeah. yeah. And also the, uh, another really exciting project that was a joint project with the school district was the uh, the artificial turf field yeah. behind NDSS, mm -hmm. which I think is really exciting. And we're going to be having the official opening of that fairly Did soon. Did they come well. out of that fund? I can't speak to that. I'm okay. sorry. I don't know for sure. Okay. There might be people out there who are interested in more ice. I, I, I did hear some murmurings at the time that there is, a, there is a need for more ice, not necessarily the way the event centre was presented. So, yeah, what I've found being involved with the Parks, Recreation and Wellness Committee is that our problem is in what we call the shoulder seasons between uh, ice uh, being in the arenas and then being taken out for lacrosse. And as I think we know of all sports, their seasons seem to be extending and growing longer and longer. Mm -hmm. So here it is nearly summer and the NHL playoffs are just starting. Um, so fours. Yes. So our problem is when, when hockey season should be ending and we need dry floor space for lacrosse, hockey still wants the ice in. So do we need more ice space? We could do with another arena. I don't think it's crucial at this point, but it's one of the reasons that we did uh, build the dry floor facility that I just referred to, the lacrosse uh, facility in Harewood. So that right. lacrosse will have a place that they can use for their practice and not have to take up ice, ice time. Mm -hmm. So it's still somewhere on a list? It's somewhere. And as the city grows and our population grows and our facilities get older, of course, yeah. eventually they're going to need replacement. Yeah. Yeah. I want to mention on the replacement problems. aspect. Just one person have, talking at a sorry. time. Sorry. Oh, as I said, every city has that problem yes. with ice. Yes. Um, it's um, not a phenomenon. Go yes. ahead. And that's so. what you were talking about, the 1%. Yes. yes. Earlier. Um, my, my third question, every third question is the, uh, the roof of Frank Crane Arena. Um, do we, does Frank Crane Arena need a new roof? Not to my knowledge, but it's, it's not something I've ever heard mentioned. Um, but I will say this, in, in doing tours of the Nanaimo Ice Center and the other facilities, I was really impressed to know that our staff does have a long-term um, facility replacement plan uh -huh. and and people seem to think oh we just go along and then all of a sudden gee we need a new we need a new ice rink or a new roof or something no they they chart very carefully every piece of machinery and every facility what is its life expectancy and when should we start to be really seriously budgeting towards replacement so in terms of that specific one the roof i can't speak to that but i'm sure that it's somewhere on somebody's list Fred, you know yeah. that. Sorry. Go ahead. Who would know the answer to that question? I would suggest probably somebody in the Parks and Recreation okay. Department, uh, Richard Harding or one of his uh, 
uh, workers. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, All right. We've got some plans for improving these facilities. They're getting a little older. There's some stuff on the website too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Fred, you had a question right at the beginning when Ian wasn't here about the hotel. Do you want to ask him that question? About the what? About the hotel. Or are you satisfied oh, oh, with the answer you um, got? I think here? Jerry answered it pretty well, pretty fully. Um, Jerry gave, I, I gave Jerry just a real softball lob <laughs> question. Oh, we like those. Let's get started here at the, uh, give an update on the, on the, on the hotel. Okay, so And I think Jerry uh, answered it fully. Good. Good. So basically it's moving ahead and everything yeah. is, is on track and I'm really excited. Yeah, about April 20th. So we have time got for one, one more question and an answer. Yeah. Let's mention one more thing to do with that big pot of money for the event center. I don't know how big it is. But we are desperately, desperately needing more sustainable transportation measures. So the cycling paths, which are very nice to have some divided paths, most people find them very good for parking and for um, for other purposes. But that's a good start that the city is finally uh, beginning to do. But to actually have them divided, to actually have the mm -hmm. cones on them, so that so that cyclists <coughs> feel safer because we don't feel any safer with those lines. The lines do nothing for us. Uh, to put money into that and walking trails so that people, most people live within five kilometers of the workplace, and that is walkable and cyclable, but we need infrastructure to take people through there. And I think that if we want to make Nanaimo more affordable and attract younger adults, that, that would be a really wise investment for this. Place. Right. And, and, and I'm glad you, you bring that up, Ian, because just last night we had a Parks, Recreation and Wellness Committee meeting, and we had a presentation from uh, Brian Zurich, who's one of the city planners, okay. and he was talking about the hospital area mm -hmm. and the challenges with development there, with parking there. and. <laughs> um, but but one of the things that he showed us was in their planning, and I want to have time to talk about this. Um, the 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 street design with uh, allowing for safe bike paths, for allowing for boulevards, more green space, walking trails that would connect with the hospital around the hospital to Beaufort Park, and utilizing that. I was really impressed with the long-term planning that takes into account. What you're talking about. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, it really yeah, is. Say goodbye to you. No, oh, I'm sorry to leave. <laughs> Thank you. Can I not I just stay? No. <laughs> Thank you for coming. You will know that this will be the best table. I can tell. Oh, boy. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Thank you very much, everybody. It's a pleasure. Thanks, Ian. All right. We rock as a table. Oh, yeah, no, yeah, we do. <laughs> well, there's a lot of knowledge around this table. <laughs> and out there too. Yeah, yeah. 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 Who knows?
So now they're listening to us. Okay, so now we have to watch what we say. Right. Hello, Mr. Council. Yeah, what we That's say. It. Yeah. I get to see all my Facebook friends. Facebook Live. Facebook. Yeah, but they've been very, very, very good so far. Uh, well, so far. They yeah. just, they've been saving it up. We'll see. Yeah, he's here now, so. <laughs> Do you read Facebook? Now we're testing every day. How, how much fun is that? Isn't that fun? I love it. Isn't Steve. that fun? As a, as a non spread Nanaimoite, it's great to get all that. Oh, it's awesome. It's so wonderful. I love feedback. So we're Great ready. I missed the beginning of that. But All right. I'm sure it will come I'll let you know. And we're right. back live here uh, on your Isco. Anybody on Facebook who's watching can ask us questions. Uh, we've got some older questions that we've given some of the other counselors. So I think I'm just going to give you some of those fun ones from earlier and we're going to get your thoughts on them. Um, we're going to start off with one of the first ones we had, which was a question about the home hockey, and we spent a fair amount of money on it. Um, Councillor Hong had a lot of comments and ways that he thought that was well spent with the news. I'm wondering what your thoughts on that are. Well, I was the chair of the hometown hockey event, and it was a one-time opportunity for the city to uh, put its best foot forward. Um, there's been it was a 10-day event. The majority of the hometown hockey events across the country over the last three plus years have been three-day events, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, culminating on the Sundays. And we, um, as a city, saw the event as an opportunity to showcase our cultural heritage. And it was very timely because as everybody knows, our First Nations population in Nanaimo and our relationship with the First Nations really needed some help. And we really needed to uh, address across the country, or at least introduce across the country, A, how beautiful Nanaimo was. We knew that we were going to get uh, countless, countless hours of time on national TV. Uh, we wanted to do some facility infrastructure opportunities that have never been done in Nanaimo before, with outdoor skating for 10 days. I know staff have wanted to do that for three decades. I manage this property, so I know that very well from back in the 80s and the 90s. We always wanted to do that. And you, we needed a catalyst for us to be able to do that, and that turned out to be the hometown hockey event. And uh, so showcasing the, our First Nations and our lovely properties, Newcastle Island, uh, across the country and beyond. Um, yeah, so we invested in it. It was a it was a significant investment. I think council approved in the neighborhood of three hundred and forty thousand dollars. I think around ninety thousand dollars was raised in the community to support the event, and and I think we actually spent a little bit more than I think it ended up being about four hundred and forty eight thousand dollars. A lot of staff time. Um, but at the end of the day, a wonderful event, and an event that we probably never will see again um, in my lifetime in Nanaimo. Further discussion? I think the way the question was asked in the first place, it sounded a little bit like um, when you're building a house and you keep asking for extra things, of course it's going to cost more. But what we've been hearing from the two councillors that we've heard from is uh, some pretty useful explanations about what the extra money was spent on. Is that not right? I think it's, um, it's extremely accurate. I mean, we, we really did want to put our best foot forward because we also wanted to build the infrastructure so that, and it, it takes time to build the infrastructure. You can't, we, we couldn't have everything all at once, so piece at a time. And there's other pieces that are going to be necessary to be able to turn the Spialana like a Butchart Gardens, if you will. I'm not going to call it Butchart Gardens. <laughs> but December 1st to January 5th or 6th on an annual basis and turn it into an outdoor skating event to turn it into uh, get the construction industry, just like the gingerbread houses that we build and we auction off at the ICC have the entire construction industry build little houses down there, little craft stores that will be inside, hot chocolate, Santa Claus is going to helicopter in, we're going to do little horsey rides, we're going to have a, a, an amusement sort of theme. 
then auction those houses off. People can buy them for their backyards or whatever when it's all over and raise those monies for certain things. So there, like, there is a plan that has morphed from the hometown hockey event. And uh, yeah, there was, you know, there, we learned how to make outdoor ice because our staff didn't have any experience in that. We learned how to maintain outdoor ice because staff didn't have any experience in that. And so there's a lot of intellectual property that all, like you, ha you have to do things to know if you can do things. And so I'm, I'm really happy we did them. And we put Scott Morrison from the NHL and Sportsnet, Ron McLean, Tara Sloan, every member of that hometown hockey event staff told us unequivocally in the three plus years when they were in Nanaimo that they had been doing the hometown hockey event, this was the best event that they have ever done, the best city that they've ever visited. And that was important because it also created our relationship with the First Nations that needed a lot of help at that time. That's Thank a good you point. That. Thank you that uh, you've had the opportunity to express fully. Fred. That was a good point because uh, about, about what you're saying about with, with, uh, with Ron and Scott and Tara, because Tara was very emotional when she went to Newcastle. And you could really tell she really, really enjoyed the, uh, the the visit to Newcastle Island, and and I I like your point about you know really solidifying our relationship with First Nations. Um, it's important. Fred, would you tell the people out there in Facebook land who Tara is? Well, Tara Sloan, Tara Tara Lang, no, Tara Lang. She's one of the she's one of the Tara the Sloan. Sloan, she's the co-host of, of Hometown Hockey. Thank you. Her and Donna, her and Ron McLean. Thank you. Uh, anything from you two? You're here, here as citizens to ask questions of council. Not on this one, no. No, 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 no but on a this new subject. question. New question. Okay. So we actually asked some of the previous questions that you want to bring up again, but I thought maybe we'd get one. Anything from the table that's new and circle in? New for Mr. Bestwick, anyway. Oh. Uh, well, I think I'll start with the question here. Do you rather we went out there into the cyberspace? We're hoping to see the impact yeah. you, but the other one that's been cut that I've been bringing up here to ask earlier on was about the homelessness and the crime downtown and what the city's doing to try and improve that situation. And the drug use. And the drug use, of course. Well, the, certainly, I mean, the proliferation of the homelessness or the disenfranchised that have arrived in our city, I think has exploded in the last six months, uh, maybe longer and than six months. Um, I think the, you will recall back in 2004 to 2007 when the Bank of Island Conference Center was approved and started to be built, that there was a red line uh, prolific offenders and I, I don't know what the proper term please don't vagrants or whatever in and around the red zone the red zone the was red zone. were were ushered up mm -hmm. and it was made uncomfortable to be in our downtown core and I think many of those people chose not to, to remain in the Nimo period let alone the downtown core because it was uncomfortable Oh, certainly. And so I think just most recently we invest or we've approved three hundred and forty thousand dollars towards some security, some cleanup, some bylaw enforcement, some uh, a, a living room environment, hopefully that might allow people to have somewhere dry and clean and to go during the days um, when they have to leave where they slept the night before. Uh, and I don't honestly know what the I, I don't know what the solution is. I, I I'm not an expert subject expert in this field for sure. Um, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I do know that there's a lot of download from the provincial government that needs to be addressed because it's only something that I think considerable amount of money can help fix. And I know we're gonna somebody's gonna say, well, what about the the 40 units in Granbury that you declined. 
so that'll probably be the next piece of the question but um, okay. I know that my I think my time is up okay well uh, then that gives us a space for discussion and, yes uh, people will have comments to make do you have one do you have one uh, not about this issue oh. no I, I, I'll wait for my turn so if I could just add to that, I think you're totally right. I think the province has really downloaded a lot to, this, to the municipalities. And not only that, but the taxation, the amount of dollars that the feds and the provinces keep on getting goes up and up way faster than the rate of inflation. But municipalities are supposed to stick to the rate of inflation or something close to that. Well, I think that's impossible. So we end up with the problems, but not the extra revenues to accommodate this problem. So that we're stuck with that. So. My question then, or my comment is, to add to, to what you've said, is the federal government decided to, in its wisdom a number of years ago, to make more money by making housing something that could be investable, that you could invest in and flip and make more money. And so we have a lot of empty units. Now the province has decided to make Nanaimo one of those areas that you can't go and do that so easily without getting some extra taxation. So hopefully that'll be addressing it. But I know people that could not afford to live here and have now moved to Alberta. They can't afford to live here. It's just too expensive. I know people who are afraid of getting kicked out of their current residence because now their rents have gone through the roof. So what can the city do about that? Well, if you could add a whole bunch more housing, that would bring, that would cool the whole market down. But how much money does the city have to create a bunch of housing? So my idea is to allow for the city to allow rezoning so that you can have many small homes put into, a, say, a, a one-acre spot, because right now we've got a minimum square footage that houses have to be, and that doesn't doesn't allow for tiny homes. So, just well, I, I just want, if I could just go backwards, the, the province with the Cranberry Project, if you will, the rapid response to housing, and it was rapid, and all of a sudden, boom, we have to find a location. And boom, it becomes the Cranberry site. And there wasn't a considerable amount of consultation with the community and all that stuff, whether or not it's the right place, wrong place, you like it, you don't like it. We asked for an extension. We needed more time to find a more suitable place if that wasn't. And because our Chase River Day Care Center and was right there, we have our um, Chase River uh, Boys and Girls Club and all that stuff. So we need to build a new one out there by the fire department on that site, potentially. So it was like, is that the best site? Ugh, where are we going to put the... So maybe once we build that, maybe the Cranberry Moose Hall Lodge site is the best site for a housing project, not that one over there. And so I think it was the rapid response. I think it was good intentions, and I think there was unintended consequences that happened out of good intentions. And now everybody sort of feels bad about it and has egg on their face and whatever, whatever. Okay, we have two people who were planning to make a comment. Fred small, small houses. I think the. Do you remember the twelve cubed homes that were on the corner of Meredith and Bowen? Loved them. Um, loved them visited them, took my kids there, they wanted to buy one or do whatever they wanted they could do. And it sort of went away and then lane houses and cube homes and small homes on TV became the thing. Um, but it's still expensive to buy a piece of dirt. So do we, now what do we do? Do we, do we provide the piece of dirt? The, so we're really not in the development business it's so we do habitat for humanity we do all kinds of or sorry we yeah habitat for humanity we just approved some properties Ian was mentioning that yeah so it's, it's I mean you can never do enough all I what I have found is you can never do enough you just can't do enough there's always going to be hardships always we, we, that, we will now make some space for you to thank you. Make on that point I believe and correct me if I'm wrong the city's responsibility for housing for those at the risk of homelessness or those that are homeless is to provide land. The province provides the building, the province directs what type of building it's going to be, and the province also pays for the people that look after the people that move in the housing. 
when we had the session at Chase River at the Boys and Girls Club, would it not have been better if the province put on a presentation followed by a presentation on what they wanted, followed by a presentation by Pacifica on what they wanted to do, and at the end of that, thank the city for providing the land, because that's all they do, along with the sewage connections, etc. And then have a question answer period. Instead, the mayor, one councillor, two staff members showed up and literally got attacked. Do you think that it would have been handled better if it was the province had done it? Well, it might have been easier on the municipal employees. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, the guys that went. Um, I was out of country when that took place, and again, that was that rapid thing. All of a sudden, boom! There's been no community consultation, and boom! We better do one next week. And should the province have been there? Probably, but don't forget, Bill, and you will remember when we selected five sites with Rich Coleman and the government of the day that was going to build. 200 to 300 units in Nanaimo, yeah. and we had to provide the property. Yeah. And then the other organizations were going to run the these things. Well, we, we had a lot of pushback. A lot of pushback on the sites that were selected. Because we only have so much property. We don't own everything. Exactly. So, Moving right to know. Sure. Thank you. coming in. Oh, no. It's a topic that had come up earlier because I believe just recently declined the current budget, so we're still working on figuring it out. Somebody had asked. Do we ever get to know who's asking on Facebook, or do we just... Do we ever get to know who's asking? Uh, this is Ed that's asking this one. Who? Ed, Ed Chan. Oh, yeah. Is the name. Um, the questions are posted on Facebook, so theoretically, we should all be there later on when we post them if you want to see the exact questions, everybody else. Yeah, this is Ed Chan. Um, they wanted to know why did you wait until so late in the budget slash financial plan process to direct the 2019 budget tax increase being limited to 2%? That's a good question. Um, so right up until the time that you have to make decisions is, in my humble opinion, fair game. And so until such time as, and personally, I would like our uh, 2018 fiscal budget to be completed provisionally in December of 2017 and adopted in January, first or second meeting of January for the year. So, and I wasn't happy with our budget when it was 2.7% increase. I wasn't happy with it then, although it was provisional, and yes, we had opportunities. Uh, I attended every single finance and audit committee meeting as its chair. Many others didn't show up on council to hear the debate, hear the discussion, hear sending it back to staff to bring back to us. So I get my chance at the council table, like everybody else. I don't support the three point, and, and, and before last Monday, it was 3.08 that it was going up to. Then it came back at 3.02. So I don't know what happened in that period of time after a meeting of council previous to that in finance and audit. So for me, until such time as, and this isn't late, I've been on council for 13 years. I would say 11 of the 13 years we don't adopt the budget until two weeks before the deadline of May 14th or 15th or 16th or whatever it is. So do I like it? No. Do, did I run my campaign in 2014? Like I ran every campaign for four of them on the premise of fiscal accountability and lower taxes and keeping taxes as low as we can? Yes. And so that's what I'm doing in the greater good of the entire community. And what people don't remember is 3.08% is Nanaimo 
we're not talking the three plus percent from the regional district. And we're not talking garbage, and we're not talking water, and we're not talking sewer user fees on top of that. Okay. So that we're looking at about six percent if we do that. Um, right. I'd like to stay on this topic. Sure. Um, uh, a one percent is a huge amount to ask uh, for staff to cut. Uh, it's almost unrealistic. We, the reason why we have high water sewage is because of the infrastructure that we had to uh, uh, update. It's something that we all know that we had to do. So whether the fact that we may not like higher taxes, we know that we needed these things. Uh, the shelf life was ready to go, so we have now had to pay them off. But to actually drop the tax cut a whole percentage point, there's going to be some services that are going to be cut. And so as the chair of the finance committee, how can you um, uh, assure constituents that their services are not going to be cut? Sure. In 2017, we had a 1.5% increase to taxation. 1% of that goes to infrastructure. But we didn't have these big projects in 2017 either. Which big projects are you talking about? Garbage, eight million, the new water treatment center, and the sewage. All happened within this year, did it not? No, not in 2018. Okay. So the so let me just go back. Okay. 2017, 1.5% increase, and we had a 2.7 million dollar surplus. Okay. So if the assumption is, and ask, speaking with community development about building and growth, that's where our taxes come from. Okay. And we've increased our parks and recreation fees by at least a minimum of 1%, and they're busier than ever. Mm -hmm. So the assumptions that you have to make are that all things being equal, if we have a 3% increase, then we'll have a $5.4 million surplus? Will we? Well, I'm, I'm just saying, I, I don't know if we will, but our surpluses have been significant over the last 20 years. My point is, when we have surpluses, which is taxation, we've already taxed you for it, then use some of the taxation surpluses carry forward. Not all of it, not $2.7 million, but take a portion of that proportionately to offset taxes, to try to keep them in a reasonable place. And for me, a reasonable place is something less than we're being asked to tax. So, where are we going to find it? In a, in a budget of $140 million with 9, 10, 11 departments, I think we can honestly find savings to the tune of 1% out of all of these departments that will not fundamentally impact service levels. Your right. own, may I have a, your own uh, acting financial, uh, I don't know what her title is, Miss Mercer, doesn't agree with you. So if she, who knows the numbers, says that that is a task that she would prefer to have some guidance from council. Um, why are you disregarding that? Well, we go through this every year at budget time. This isn't new. Wh which way do we want to do it? Do we want to direct staff to come back with a 2.5 or 2% percent level? Or do we want to make all the cuts? Or So I've done this 13 years, and it's been different 13 times. So, do I think that it's unfair to ask staff to go back to their department heads and say, hey, that's fine, do we, do we really need that? Do we really need that? Can we wait two years, three years? Like, do we really need it? Um, or can we do without it? Or how is that going to impact the delivery of services? Like the negotiation process. Well, I, I think I think if you've got a department that has a $20 million budget and you ask them to please try to find $100,000 that we can do without. Okay. Because maybe it ends up being a half a percent and not a percent, but I'm all about saying, 
make every effort you can to trim, to reduce, to lean. So that's not okay. using the reserve funds then? <laughs> well, we might use some of the reserve you know that you, you mean the surplus? Yeah. Like, sure, use some of the Mrs. surplus. Mrs. Mercer said on the, at Monday's meeting that if you use either one of those two, general revenue is one and it still hasn't come back to me, the other one, she said. Fun. But if you use both, either one of those, you're going to mess up your taxation uh, for the next year and maybe su subsequent years after that. So why would you then, and it's not good practice, she said, to play with the surpluses. So then why would you use that to bring taxes down? Well, where okay, is that so surplus going? Okay. Keep it short I don't because know. we've got three people waiting. <laughs> sure. That's why I'm asking. Go for it, right? Well, sure. that surplus to me is money that we taxed our citizens for. We have a we. You do. You look backwards, and you say, "What's our surplus been for the last 20 years? Every year." And you go, you know what? It's like doing your investment with your investment portfolio. You 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 look at it and you go, "This is here." We're, 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 we're never not going to have a surplus. I agree with you. So we're always going to operate at a surplus. What per, what percent or portion of that surplus might you like to apply to try to keep next year's taxes down is subjective and you can make that decision on an annual basis. And this year, like so when you look at 20, uh, 2019, it's, apparently it's going to be 1.7% forecast. So maybe that's a that's a year where you're not going to use surplus because 1.7%, 1 1.9, 1 2. Per, who can't live with that? But you okay. No, we have okay. to uh, Tracy uh, and okay, keep this going. Like, yeah, and the, and the, <laughs> Tracy and Victor, they the middle of December, they uh, read all the media and open to the public. And the thing that Tracy said was that. We're having this starting this early, so there will be no surprises. It could be well debated. So this is just kind of, kind of a comment to what you were talking about earlier. And you know, and here we are, like four months later, and there's all these surprises. Like um, I don't understand. Your comment. It's yeah. clear, and we're going to get something from Bill and something from Ian, and then we're going to have to stop. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to say we were talking about surpluses, and. Departure Bay Activity Center, one of my favorite topics with you, Bill. In 2013 or 2014, the city put aside $1.9 million into their budget that year. That money is now in surplus because it's designated for Departure Bay. So each year it shows up as surplus. So $1.9 million, $1.9, it doesn't add up, it stays the same. It's off the radar for at least two more years, according to Parks and Rec. So in 2021 is the earliest that it could be that something could be done at Departure Bay Activity Center. By that time, seven or eight years have passed. <laughs> the $1.9 million that's in reserves is now going to cost you $3.72 million to fix. So by taking money out of reserves, we're harming the future projects. Is that not correct? You just got to find money to put it back in. Okay. No, the money's there. Okay. No, but if you take it out, then you got to put that money back in. You have it. 10 seconds to answer. He's made the point. He's <laughs> <laughs> made the point. Are you going to give up? So the $1.9 million that was put directly, specifically for that project three, four, five, six years ago, in real dollars, two years from now, is going to cost $4 million to replace that facility or whatever that number is. There's reserves, surplus monies in other places that can go to. And so if council says, we want to replace the Departure Bay Activity Center and we got $1.9 in the bank, but we need $5 million to do it, then we got to find $3 million in other reserves. And there's your answer. Right. Right. There's, there's your answer. answer. Well, there's but, your but, answer, but, but it's Okay. It doesn't mean it's not going to be there. There's lots of money. There's lots of money. you got to move, I guess. well you know I, all I can say about that Ian is like that whole project remember when we were going across railway crossings in the south end it was going to be like six 
million dollars to do like three lo three crossings? Yeah. Oh, okay. oh my God. But we don't have any trouble spending okay. money on roads. All right. Well, okay, okay, but you have to look at you have to look at numbers too. Numbers matter. Yes, and, and priorities matter. So the priority for this city is cars. Well, clear. Oh, wow. But you gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> but, but. Yes. We're, we're, we're not a metropolitan. We're not Vancouver. We're, we're not actually behind the Campbell River. We're certainly way behind the city of Victoria. So then you must be on my team when I want to get rid of the Island Quarter. No. And turn it into no. our cycling trail. Because there again, you're committing people to cars to get rid of no. the No, 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 hey, that, that no. No, no, it makes it affordable. Yeah, you guys are going to have we to have this over We can't here. cross, you <laughs> just said it. Yeah, six million bucks. Respect <laughs> the moderator, <laughs> six million bucks to yeah. cross three rails. You guys got to get rid of the rails and you'll have your trails. Because this is the parade over here. Respect the moderator, your own rules, mister. <laughs> Hello, Kelsey oh, Armstrong. Welcome to our rowdy table. I heard. What you're saying, this is your best. Is this your phone or is this the best? Bill. 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 I could just like. Well, we can't have it. Give it to you. That's still a possibility. If we're honest, if we're honest, this is a grand table. You'll love us. It's not my favorite table I've been at. So let's see if we can top my last one. We rock. Well, that is not a hard thing. We rock over here. We rock. Not only do we have our loveliness. Are we on there? Which is why we rock. We have some extra questions. So you want to go ask any questions you would like and go. All right. We're going to start with a fresh one from cyberspace here. From it was actually about a rock tunnel. Do you know anything about a particular rock tunnel here? Uh, yes. The living room? Hmm? The living, living room, room concept? Drop -in center, yes. Yeah. yeah. It was, apparently there was a drop-in center approved. Um, okay, I can talk about that. budget for it, so it might be done, John Horn said it might be done soon. Okay, what I can say about that is we've asked ca or, uh, staff to go and find us various locations where we can look, it's called the living room concept. And what that is, is a lot of times when people are staying at like the New Hope Center or Samaritan House, they have to leave at a certain time, like the shelter, 7 in the morning, 7.30. So then they're left on the streets or they go to the library, especially in rainy days. So the concept has come up. We ran it before Nanamo, I believe in around 1998, 99, and there was issues. So we've learned from that. So staff has identified different locations that we can look at. And that will be the report will be coming back to council. And we're hoping it will hit us in late May early June. Excellent. For opening time within the next couple of months or? Well, what, we, what we're going to have to look at, this is just Cheryl speaking. Yes. Okay, location, does it make sense? Because you're not going to put something in the north end where somebody can't get up there, right? So it has to be in the location. Uh, there's a lot of uh, attention being put at downtown. I believe that the hospital area has just as many issues, if not more, as downtown. So we need to look at all these, these variables. So where does it make sense to put it? Uh, could we do a concept where, you know, right now we have Caledonia Field open with the showers. Could we find a location where the showers are available at the living room as well? So these are all things that we're going to look at. Is there a place maybe that you could give them a, a warm meal at noon hour? So all of these things are being looked at. Then the options will come forward and then council will make the decision. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion on this item? What is the possibility of different school being used as a living room? They have all the facilities you mentioned. They have a lunchroom, they have showers, they have okay, even Def nap rooms. Dufferin School right now has got various uh, leases with numerous services. services, so they would have to sever those leases, which I do not think would happen. It's completely full. Yeah, they I believe one areas. area that you could look at is the Quinnell School. I think Quinnell School would be a really good one, which is the old school right behind City Hall. The one with the Discovery. Avery That's where, uh, right. where um, uh, oh, Christ, neutral zone is there. Right. So you could move Tillicum Lalem to another area, a better area. Okay, That's because they're already there anyhow, That's right? The so 
Franklin Street Gym. Franklin Street yeah, Gym. Right. Yeah. So that would be an option to look at. Uh, I believe one of the areas that some of the staff or er, uh, council thought about is where the fire hall staff is right now, the administrative staff, the old library. That's another area that they've looked at, which could be a good area too because you're right by a police and fire. Yeah. So there, there's different options that they're looking at, and there could be lots more that I'm not aware of. Yeah. Did your uh, comment get covered, Fred? Um, sorry, I just wanted to reiterate with um, because uh, uh, Mayor McKay wanted, he said he wanted, remember during the debate, um, during the debate on, he said he wanted multiple choices. He did not just want one choice. Oh, you guys debated it. And he came up with the resolution. Yes, we want several, several options brought to the table, and then council will the mayor and council will decide. Okay. Is there a timeline for this? Uh, okay. You know, like, are you trying? Sometimes the speed of government can be uh, even slower than turtles. Uh, so, is there? Uh, an urgency within council that this will happen before summer, before September, before winter starts? Right now it's staff capacity. We have to look at staff capacity. We only have certain number of staff doing so many priorities. I don't know if you heard at the one council meeting where I did say that. Okay, so we've told them to make this a priority. What about the other 12 things we've told them to make a priority? So we need to sit down as a council and determine which is our number one priority. Because when you say to, to Mr. Horn, okay, Start finding me another site for affordable housing. All right, that's my priority. Find me a site for living room. That's a priority. Uh, come up with a policy on this. That's a priority. So now, which does he do? So that's an issue for me. Like we have to look at the capacity of our staff. We need to sit down with our staff once, or the, when when an interim CAO comes on board, we need to relay to that individual. Here's our staffing priorities. You sit down with your staff. And figure it out. And it's not just your managerial staff, is it? Because no. For support for every person in a managerial position, you have to have some union positions to do the. That's staff right. Work. Yeah. So I mean, and and there's there's a lot of development going on in Nanaimo right now, like private development, like with homes and buildings and stuff. So a lot of our staff are busy with that. Like mm -hmm. we hear complaints continually from our development area that we're behind on that too, right? So capacity is an issue that we have to look at and prioritize. Just a quick question. What are wait a minute, the wait a minute. We're going to have a supplementary and then okay. we'll come back to you. Um, so with the, this is kind of a supplementary but kind of like adding on as well. So with the fact that we have a reduction in staff currently right now at the city, will there be a hiring uh, fair, so to speak? Uh, will, uh, and if so, will that uh, impede cutting the taxes down a percentage point? Well, here's my issue. You got two questions in there that I yeah. see. So first of all, from the staffing issue, I don't know what the staffing capacity is. Like if by capacity, I mean, we could be at fully staffed in one of those areas, but they just have too much work, the volume of work. When it comes down to hiring, that's not my decision. That will be the CEO's decision to make. Okay. Uh, I believe firmly council needs to stay out of that. What council needs to do is say like for, I, I'm a strong believer in having that community, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, fill up director of communications. I believe communications is critical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe if we take a look at the APP process that we're going through right now, if we would have had a direct communications, maybe we could have went and said, let's mail out to every citizen, here's the process, this is what it's going to be, have a return postage page envelope in there, and then I think the APP process would have been much better than what we have right now. Mm -hmm. So we've hired after Mr. Cooper was, was uh, let go. Uh, Mr. McDonald was hired, I believe, to do a lot of our communication pieces. Then we had to hire outside communication specialists on some of the other stuff. So communication is very critical. So, so, but that, again, is up to, we as a council voted on that. Then when an interim CAO comes in, their decision is to fill what positions, let's say bylaws are vacant in two spots. They need to make that determination. I don't believe we as council should be stepping on that individual's toes. We can make our recommendations. Well, yeah, I didn't see anything about stepping on just going back on that, I was going to ask you about the staff that John Horn had, but I'm going to switch, switch it up a bit. You mentioned about communications manager, director, whatever position we put it in there. Council at the last meeting, uh, we're talking about the budget, and they were talking about reducing it by 1%. 
Is there a fear that that 1% could be that communication position? Well, that would be one of them. I mean, here's my concern. Right, no, I don't. I voted against the decrease, as you know, and I'll tell you why. I don't think we should touch surpluses. I don't think we should touch reserves. Now, here's something that people haven't been talking about that we need to face. Salaries went up $1.9 million. That's, and that's out of our control. That's unions. That's arbitration. $1.2 million we have to find for the new MSP coverage, which the government just put on us this year in this term, right? So that's $1.2 million. Right there, that's $3.1 million, which is a 3% tax increase. That's just on those alone. Just those two items, not anything else. Then we have to look at the fact that uh, we need 1% increase. In my mind, you have to always build that asset management reserve. If you look, we were in one of the reserves, I can't remember which one. We're supposed to have $700,000 a year going into it. Last year, only 600 and some went in. This year, only 540. So we're robbing Peter to pay Paul. And that is my big concern. If you continue to do that, if you take our surplus, what happens if we have a natural disaster? Where do those dollars come from? And if you take a look, 2% basically is what your actual tax rate is versus, you know, your 1% for infrastructure. It's it's the cost of inflation. That's three already. So it's, it's your three. Now, in order to cut positions, I believe we could look at cutting, you might look at cutting the management and risk treasury position or whatever that was, which I voted against. Uh, we could look at eliminating the COO position because that was an extra position that was created. We could look at eliminating the uh, director of communications. But that's still going to only bring you around $500,000. So you still have to find another $500,000. Now, another example of that is we have our issues with our downtown course. We, had a, we came up with $460,000 to put towards it, which to me is still peace meal but that had to come from somewhere so obviously from surpluses in some budget so we can't keep doing that yes, I agree. so uh, that's why I believe that the three percent was a very fair increase and for the rationales that I presented okay. perfect Thank you. now I think I saw an indication there's something coming in on Facebook um, we actually can't move you might know as we start the timer game we've moved on talking about the budget um, there was a comment on the previous one you just said that the, with the drop in center dropping living room thing there's no firm date yet on that no there is not moving forward, yeah but, but it is moving forward so, yeah and then you we've talked about this uh, budget so i think people had wondered earlier where the other council is getting these numbers from this two percent and so on i think you said you're for what it makes. i'm totally for the 3.1 percent i you know i'd like to clarify on that too we have excellent staff and when, when we ask them to drop it by 1%, I don't think staff should be doing that. If we are going to do that, that should be council. Why are we asking staff to go? Now what's going to happen? Staff's going to come back with these recommendations we cut here and here. There's going to be an argument again. Here's my other issue with that. Everybody on council knew about this budget. We've had all sorts of meetings. Why did you wait till the last minute to say no? You could have said that at previous meetings. Well, I have a comment on yes. that. Yes. Yeah, we got that, first. That, 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 that brought up something interesting. I watched the Audit and Finance Committee meeting, and on the Finance and Audit Committee meeting, we saw a duplication of what happened there happen at the next council meeting. So, at the Audit and Finance Committee, they said certain things about putting it on staff to look after. A week and a half later, they said the same thing for staff to look after. Why not, during that week and a half, did all of council, not just yourself, but all council work together to come up with a solution. I agree. That's what people are asking. So now what we're doing is we're having a special in-camera meeting on Monday to deal with it. It's, it's also an open meeting. Is it open? Well, we have one in-camera meeting and one open. So you have a open oh, meeting I know. from 9 to noon. That's, 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 that's oh, the in-camera. Is, in no, that's not. The in-camera is on uh, bylaw 7000. From 1 to 4. What's bylaw 7000? Uh, exempt one staff. Speaking of the Sorry. Problem. Exempt staff bylaw. Okay. Uh, anything new? Fred? Nothing new. If anybody is watching on Facebook, we're actually almost record numbers here, so it's very popular. Um, <laughs> we're just looking for new questions. If, any, if, if uh, the internet does have any, was there any? Okay I'm, I'm going to go and take you back to one of the earlier questions and exercise my my little bit of power here. Okay. <laughs> we were asked what you might do about food security. Oh yes, food. about which? <laughs> food security. Food security. There's a wide open one. That is interesting because I didn't know a lot about food security until Sasha Burton ran on that, and I learned a lot more about it. And it's, there's a lot of valuable points in there. Like, I think one of the issues that we look at is, like, I don't think we should ever touch our farmland. Like, we're seeing happening in Delta and those areas. I mean, we don't have much as it is. So we need to look at that. I think when you look at... Um 
you got to look at it from the RDN perspective on that because it's a regional perspective. So the goal is supposed to be that we do our most of our development within Nanaimo and build up and you know the infrastructure and keep areas like Cedar and Anus and that were supposed to be left for your farming, but that hasn't happened. So that's a bigger product where you got to look at the RDN to that. Um, another issue which we don't think about again is like if there's a major earthquake or something happens. We're in trouble if we can't get the ferries or a plane to come in and give us food. So things like the five-acre farm, which I went out to see, like brilliant things. Like those are things we should be looking at saving and try to invest in because I think you're, you're going to get it back in spades. You can look at using that for like the food share programs, etc. that can be used for that. Um, I would like to see more community gardens. I mean, the last one was up at, that I know of was off of, um, Uplands and Turner on the Highway. Well, that shut down now because development's going in there. So the other thing, like if you take a look at the Green Thumb Nursery, if that's for sale, as far as I'm concerned, that land should never be removed from farming, or I think it's ALR, because once you do that, you can never get it back. Yes. It's a very valuable site. Mm. Bill, you were next. Then, you right? just touched on a couple of things. The food security, is that more an RDN issue than a city issue? I, I think it's a combination, because don't forget, well, all of us basically sit at, it's eight out of nine sit at the RDN, yes. so you can bring it there. But I think even as a city, when you have a place like the Five Acres farm we should be doing stuff to preserve that but you were saying that it's but more I, of a cedar it's, harrington well that's that's the plan right because that's where your agricultural area is it's not in the city of nanaimo so the plan is you keep that as agricultural you build nanaimo up or you do the infill buildings but i don't think we've been following that from what i've seen because cedar's developing like you wouldn't believe and the news is developing like you wouldn't believe errington is developing like you wouldn't believe so we're losing our farmlands and then the other thing that's happening to keep our farmlands going in the LR, people just have to raise like 20 chickens and, and make $2,000 and they're considered a farm, right? So that skews your stats too. Good one. Right. Um, what about opening up the bylaws for Nanaimo instead of having front gardens, I mean front lawns having gardens, uh, and actually raising chickens and pigs actually inside city limits if you have, say, a uh, if you have the proper fencing to keep them in, you could raise a pig or maybe a goat. Well, it's interesting. I just came back from Vegas, and uh, we were staying outside, and there was horses in yards, cows in yards. So it was very interesting to see that. I don't know enough about it. But that's something. Guys, where I wanted to raise pigs and the park. Uh, that's something I would have to do a lot of research you on. Think, like what you said about if we had some sort of natural disaster. We used to, as an island, produce 87% of our food sources, and now we're down to probably 11% or less. So if we opened up bylaws that allowed people that wanted to grow a garden in their front yard... Well, I think you could. I don't know why no, you could. No, I think it, it's against the law, is it not? It I, can I, be tricky. It's I don't working. think it is. I'd have to look into that, but I think you can, because I know people that do. I think animals is an issue, though. Like, I mean... What a shock to me when I found out you couldn't have rabbits. Yeah. Like, you know, and that's the other thing that, that you know, like as a council person, especially being relatively new to it, there's so many bylaws to try and learn. It's yes. unreal. So I've been focusing on the main ones, like trying to learn and understand how to run a budget, like, like do that kind of stuff. Homelessness, affordable housing, the master transportation plan, like I was in Victoria, did Victoria on the move. Recognize the importance of having proper bike lanes. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a car person, always will be. But I also recognize the upcoming generations want the proper bike lane so they can move away from that. So if we're not planning for it now, when do we start planning for it? And I don't think we can do it piece metal like we have been doing. I think we need to really sit down and when we have these plans, we need to follow them because otherwise it's a waste in everybody's time and effort. Just words. It is. Just, just a minute. Jeff, do you have any comments there that you want to share with us? Um, nobody here has any comments about food strategy. We have more questions coming up. Um, well, let's go with John, the next question. question. <laughs> Uh, do we have time? Um, we could do some information about what is allowed, because I don't know personally what they allowed. To That's where a communications director would be fabulous, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I heard a while ago that that you could not grow a garden in your front yard. You were uh, perfectly willing and able trouble. to do it in the backyard, I don't think but you couldn't do it in the front, and you couldn't have like chickens either. And so I'm just thinking for, yeah. there's a lot of people here that might want to do that. There's a lot that would want it, but at least we could then, if, if our bylaws were adaptable, um, you know, we could then promote 
doing it more ourselves, right? And there can, sharing. There can be issues, but we just don't know what they are. So we, we haven't got the information to deal no. with that right now. Bill, did you have something you needed? I had something I wanted to throw in what Cheryl said regarding bylaws. And that is, the city of Nanaimo has so many bylaws Eleven. that are not even looked at. Oh, bylaws. Yeah. Oh, no, our bylaws. I thought you meant people. Uh, and <laughs> the number of bylaws that we have that are not enforceable is unbelievable. At a recent safety meeting that we had, that you attended I'm just listening. recently? I'm listening. The biggest it. concern there from the people at our table anyway, which was a table of seven, okay, yeah. was information. The people in the community are not receiving the information to know what bylaws we can and can't do. Like Ray was saying, how many, can we have a fireman's finder? Can we have in the back? Nobody knows because it's not being communicated properly because there's too many and there's nobody looking at them. So how do we solve that? That's that's where I think when you take a look at some of the stuff uh, Miss Sammer was trying to do as the CEO was look at re rewriting all of our bylaws, doing a review of all of our bylaws. What are legal? What aren't legal? What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? A lot of our bylaws are written in the 90s and the 80s, and they're no longer. So there has to be a, a review. So she was looking at doing all of that. So I think that's something for whatever the interim CEO comes in is we need to prioritize the bylaw review. Like I believe that strongly because I read some of our bylaws and going well that doesn't make sense. It contradicts this bylaw and. So it has to be restructured. A lot of our policies are outdated, so they need to be restructured as Horses well. Horses are illegal in the city, you know. <laughs> Probably we, are. We have a good question coming in. Yeah, let's um, go on to a slightly different question here. Um, this one I have to ask a lot. It's yeah. talking about our wonderful parks in the city. They ask, uh, Gail here asks, are there any plans to improve the parks that we have, improving and expanding parking? Upgrading the trail. Uh, specifically, they point out Neck Point and Piper's Lagoon have been packed lately and will get even busier. I can test this. Yeah. If you show up on a nice day, it's hard to get parking near, near Neck Point. Okay, so that comes back to what we've been talking about before. People don't believe in cars, right? So one of the thick strategies that they use, and developers use it all the time, if you don't build the parking, people won't drive cars, which I don't believe. I don't. I think if we had a different transportation system, maybe, but we don't. So we do have to look at that. And then what happens again is these people that are coming then park in the neighborhoods, and it's a big issue. So I don't know how we address that. And if other we're than looking at that point in time, Mr. Bill, we're looking at some rather vulnerable property, but we don't want to overused and overstepped over. Yeah, those are issues you have to look at. But when it comes to the parks, yes, there is a park strategy. Uh, there was a presentation to us, I believe in November, by Mr. Harding about Mafio Sutton Park and the fact there's a partnership with the Rotary where we're going to do some more inclusive parks in there. So, like, there'll be stuff for people in wheelchairs and different things. So there is a park strategy. So that is being developed. And it did come to council for information only. So there is strategies to try and improve our park system. Waterfront walkways, another been told that's a priority for the city but you know that's a lot of dollars too so we have to look at that um, and there's issues around that still too like the repairing way we need to do some more consultation with Sinemo Nation which is critical well, if she, if she, I want to move totally on to a different topic we're about to run out of time Oh, we're about a minute. Oh, yeah, close. What do we have, Reed? We got a yeah. Well, I'd like to do on the same topic. It, it's mind. really not. Yeah, you go on the same topic because oh, mine's oh, not Okay, on the same topic so. with parks, next point and Piper's a good sticker. Uh, a lot of people aren't familiar with this point. Does have four parking lots, not just one. That's true. You can yes, also use the school parking lot school. after school hours. So that brings it up to five parking lots. Yeah. I go to the next point at least once a week, and Piper's Lagoon sometimes twice a week. Piper's Lagoon doesn't have a lot of power people. It is limited. I might have to walk two blocks, but yeah. I'm fine. Okay, and that's, that's another valid point. We as individuals now in society want things right now, right there. We don't want to walk for it. We don't want to do any of that kind of stuff. Like, we want to park within six inches. That's right. So that those are issues. We have to be able to, to start getting out of our cars and do some walking to those areas. That's one of the reasons we're going is for the fresh air and the exercise. So, But then again, if you think, but even then though, then you're putting the parking in the neighborhoods, which takes away from the neighborhoods and, and they get like the hospital area, prime example. People can't even have friends over because, especially during the daytime, because it's all parked. 
it's used. So we have to look at that. Like, it's a really difficult situation because at one minute, if you have bikes, you know, you can bike in there, but Hammond Bay would be, I can't imagine cycling on Hammond Bay. I'd be scared. Have we looked, have we looked at some of the European examples? Because I had this problem for the so we've got some ideas. Ooh, that's a loud one. <laughs> <laughs> well, we found a good one. Thanks, Cheryl. Oh, thank you. Hope I answered them. Yeah. That was very good. Isn't that neat? That's not just going to run again? Yes. I like her. She wasn't going to, but I talked to her. Jesse Woodward's going to run, too. No, he's not. Oh, he changed his mind again. He got a... He got a... I saw that. As far as I know, he won't run. Okay. Yeah. I like Jesse. He was doing hard. He told me about it. Wednesday that he was offered the job the day before. Yeah, I saw him post it. When I spoke to him about the problem, he said that if he got this job, that he doesn't think that it would be a good fit. For the time, yeah. And he really wants to. We can still stay engaged, too. We need to get more young people engaged in politics. I think our. When you guys should Excuse me for our next session. Look at the university. You yeah. gotta get some young people in. Take a look around this room. How many young people do you see? <laughs> but that's the problem with yeah. politics, right? <laughs> you're not engaged in it because either A, you're uh, under the third age and it's yeah. not on your radar really well, yeah. or you're in that 30 to 40 age where you're so aware of you're what you're doing. Or you think it doesn't matter. Yeah. Or you think it doesn't matter who you vote in. Yeah. 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 Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I guess Thanks we gotta move. Lot. All right. Good chat. It doesn't matter to me. Who do we get next to our table? I think Mayor McKay is next. The Mayor. <laughs> or Fuller, we have not had a pleasure but either. We seem to be getting it from that table comes over to here. Oh, really? So who's at that Mayor table? McKay. Oh, and Mr. Yokin is here as well. Mr. Yokin had another engagement. Oh, did he? Uh -huh. Thank you. You will find that this is the best table. That's right. The it's, it's, it's the brightest. That's true. Not only do you have wonderful minds here, but you have Facebook. The Facebook I, have no oh, yeah, I don't so, do Facebook, but how does this? Anyways, I'll just. Well, you'll soon find out that there's some people out there who might ask a question. Okay. That's cool. cool. I'm so are you ready? Uh, voice of the internet, so I'm saying whatever uh, yep. people from the You're internet. relaying it. I get it. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Hi, Fred. You had a practice run, so you know about the timing. I was at a couple of tables earlier, so. Dan Gartshore is doing our timing to make sure we're Okay. Keep track of timing for a minute. We'll put you through your places, no, don't you? Awesome. Do the people at the table have a question that they want to ask Councillor Yoke? Just Bill. It's fine. Please. Well, I would like Thanks. to begin with my question if no one else has another one. This is the first time I'm asking this question. Um, but I would like to talk about the Port One Drive Master Plan. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what the uh, scuttlebutt or the, the um, stats that you got from everything and the open meeting that they had. Uh, myself was hugely disappointed in, in a lot of it, mainly the transit hub part. Uh, as a woman, being alone in transit hubs when it's dark is a daunting proposition. I'm assuming that men might feel that same way too but as women, we have that extra caution. And so to have a bright, beautiful downtown hub that has a place open the entire time the buses are running so that there would be that extra safety would be a huge thing for, I think, downtown there. Yep. What do you One think? One minute, perfect. So, um, first of all... not on radio for nothing. No. <laughs> thank you, thank you for the question. Um, first of all... Um, I don't claim, I don't, where the hub, where the transit hub was sort of located in that corner where the pallet station used to be. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not quite very open here. Uh, I don't even think that's the best location, the best usage. Okay. But I totally concur. Wherever it goes, it has to be well lit, have safety measures for everybody. But it's definitely hearing what you're saying about the, uh, a female demographic that may not feel safe. Yeah. Like we do not want to box anyone in, feel unsafe. So, so I'm not a big, I'm not a big fan of that location. But I'm a big fan of 110 percent what you're saying. Wherever it has to go. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Bill. I hope that, that helps. Just, rega just regarding the safety aspect, I think that everybody wants to feel safe. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think it's restricted just to the female part. No, but... I know. use transit a lot, and I also like to feel that I'm comfortable where I'm sitting waiting for the bus. Uh, regarding One Port Drive and transit, the intentional purpose of purchasing one port drive in the beginning was to turn it into a transportation hub mm -hmm. in conjunction with the RDM. Apparently that fell apart somewhere along the line. Um, Where did that go wrong? Because the they were going to take over one third for one, half the price. Yeah, one third, but predominantly still still city. Not most, I'll probably be a little offside here, but predominantly still city and now residents paying for it, whether it's the RDN or through the city. But nevertheless, that wasn't the question. So. Where, why did it fall? Is the question is why did it fall apart? Yes. Any particular thing, or was it just? I think at the RDN level, there's people like myself saying, uh, "Is that really the best spot?" Now, saying there is that the best spot, obviously, is sit here and say, "Yeah, I don't think that's the best spot." But we have to come up with the best spot. But I think the citizens of, the, of these groups like this, where should to um, help any users that use trans, trans, um, tr the buses should be the ones telling us where the best spot is. But is that the best spot or the best usage for the master plan? I personally don't think it is, but I'm thinking of mostly from the um, development. I think of, I get we gotta have, to, uh, have the buses to close, but I live in a little fantasy world where, like, I think of like the Forks, I think of Grand Island, I think of Byward Market, I think about our own and our, a combination, all that stuff and go down there. Yeah. yeah. But that one spot might not be the best spot. Why can't we work in partnership with the owners of Port, the Port Place Mall? Why can't, I'm not, I don't know where how that look or just be creative. But to answer your question, is I don't have a specific answer why it fell apart, what was the number one reason, but we have to find a spot and it has to be safe for everybody, and especially the female demographic. We could even put a do you not think on the bottom of say apartments that, that you want to build up there because you want to do it mixed use, right? Yeah, yeah. So that, that you could have one of the whole bottoms of one of the buildings yeah. be the transit hub and have uh, Greyhound, well it's not Greyhound anymore, Tofino bus, the uh, RDN down there, the, the fast ferries when they come about because they're, uh, they're working on it again to bring it about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all those sorts of things. A, a nice big coffee shop that would be open, uh, you know, I don't know if you want to do 24-7, but at least to the bus for safety. Exactly. Yeah. I didn't have a yellow card. Okay. I thought I still had time. Just, just quick, just quickly. I wanted this quickly. Actually, I will. I was going to talk about Port One Drive. I want to be crystal clear the other night why I voted against the master plan. Wasn't I'm not objecting stimulus and progress down there. We got to do stuff, do things down there. I just know with being a protected treaty village site with Stenamo, we have to do it the right way. Yes. And and that's what and we, and I believe voting eight one is not doing it the right way, especially in the area of reconciliation. They have to be at the table. Chief, mm -hmm. Chief Wise has to be involved in his team, and otherwise um, it's going to go nowhere. Yes. That's just reality. And and I, and I want something to go somewhere. I want to be crystal clear for the table and the viewers. Yeah, I hope someone's going to ask about that because. <laughs> yes, I am. Okay, go. Am I up? No, oh, no. Uh, Ian's, uh, up. Ian's up. And then and Will then... reminded me he was up, and then you're. Oh, I would like this. No, so go ahead, Fred, and then I'll follow you. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I was on Ray's uh, show, A Sense of Justice, uh, during the summer, yeah. and that was one of the best conversations we had. Discussions was that First Nations had to be front and center and. Uh, in the it, development of one port place drive and from the beginning exactly the no. exactly yeah. um because it's essential that that does occur and um my my pers 
my uh, perspective on number one port drive, I'd like to see it like gravel island. I'd like to see it as a as a mixed economy. Um, you know, and who knows? It might even bring back Greyhound. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you never know. Okay, Bill. So the question I'm, was, oh, I'm, uh, it's all right. It's okay, now, okay. <laughs> I'm really excited that you voted no the other day because I don't believe that the one port drive plan as is took enough consideration of what the residents want. And what was? The what, residents what the field. Residents In a lot of, I've attended, every open house there has been about one port drive since day one. Yes, I've have. attended every one. Yeah. People want a Granville Island concept. He showed me red at my time. So five minutes hey. are We've just gone through five minutes, and that's the process is that when we're in general conversation, it's set for five minutes. Okay. So can we still continue the topic? Or move on? We talk to our motion. I got a new Did one you not make your point? I didn't make my point. Well, my point is point. that I, I thought you did. <laughs> most people favor a Granville Island in an mm -hmm. uh, having your forgeries down there, doing your steel work, making it into what Granville Island was originally. Yeah. And the city is not going along with that. Thank okay. you. He made his point. Do you want to make Just a, a quick rebuttal would be like I say, I. I with the residents, you're never going to satisfy all the residents, but I believe you get as best and most accurate input you can. And we have to do something down there like the Forks, Granville Island, what we see other places around the country and, and also uh, globally. But the First Nations have to be involved. I'm not saying it because I'm Sanamo. I'm saying it because this case law is a treaty protected site. It's a former village site. And it's the right thing to do and the just thing to do. And why not? There's enough space for everyone to work together in the modern era and I was disappointed we didn't have, we had a chance to take a lead on this and take a show show the world that the Nanamo gets reconciliation and and we unfortunately we didn't have that moment but uh, I still live with a lot of hope. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we have a question coming in out of cyberspace. Uh, nothing. No, okay. we're clear. Sorry. I bored everyone. I'll do a new question. A new question. <laughs> I bored. I've been waiting for you to be here to ask this, yes. uh, specifically because you are Sanemo. Yeah. Uh, our relations with Sanemo are disastrous. Yeah. Um, it's abysmal. It's uh, a shame. It's a, a spot on 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 us as Nanaimoites. How do you see us coming together? What is your vision? Have you spoken with Nanaimo? What is their vision? Sure. Um, it's a um, I'll be real sensitive on that question because I want to be a, have a positive output, and I'm not going to get into the personalities and why we are today yes. in some of this. No, because no, uh, I don't yeah. believe we should be stuck. I believe, and I there's space and there's hope. Um, Chief Wise is a gem, just like his late mom, Auntie Viola. I get a little emotional thinking about Auntie Viola. Yeah. Okay. And Mike's awesome. We've got those. And, uh, I've never had the pleasure of meeting. Oh, Auntie Viola's awesome. And Mike's Mike's just scuffled in, in January. Didn't officially take till mid February, mm -hmm. around then. And Mike's Mike's very progressive. He's very Mike Chief Wise is very progressive and very respected in the First Nations world. He's a cultural leader. He gives back to the community. He gets kids paddling. He's got a canoe club giving back to keep kids off the streets and giving healthy lives, role modeling. And he does that on his own. He runs a very successful canoe club all regular. They race in Hawaii and everywhere. At the same time, he's very culturally connected. And he also understands and respects both of He worked for years as a supervisor for Fortis Gas. So he's a very balanced individual. So he gets it. And not seeing previous leaders did it. So we're very lucky to have Mike today. Mm -hmm. and and in the next six months, that's part of my goal is before, wherever the future leads me politically, I don't know, but I'm going to concentrate on that relationship and I'm going to tap into my, they're literally like my brothers and sisters down there. So I'm going to spend six months, regardless of where this goes, the end of this journey right now, make sure we have, create some foundation for the future to work with because I'm going to concentrate on that. And I'm really disappointed that the city hasn't tapped into me or asked me questions on that, but, but I, I'm not going to sit back no more. I'm just going to take a positive approach and try to lead that relationship. And you too. Uh, that was the answer. And Bill has a new question. No, my question is directly related to what Ray asked. Oh, okay, so and what you going to ask what I want to ask. <laughs> so do we have is, a question? Is it at... Is, the relationship between Nanaimo 
and the city of Nanaimo, the two councils, at such a point where a mediator has to come in and sit down and bring the two together at the same time? Um, I really don't think so because most of the council and our council interact, know each other from away from political roles, and um, but do they discuss things at official? Has no, we have not met with Sanemo far too long. There has not been a pog meeting. I think there's one set coming up, and I heard through the grapevine. But in the same, same because time. I believe the city council of Nanaimo should sit down with the tribal council of Sanemo, and they should sit down together. And absolutely, we should. We absolutely we, we should. Have a situation needs to be fixed. We need to get it fixed, and we got to. Um, they had some requests from the city and from some political people on our on our mayor and council. I won't get into that. That they wanted some. There were some situations and Sanemo requested some apologies, but no, that's never came. So I'm going to encourage Mike, you're never going to get it, unfortunately, from... They got apologies from the full council. We yeah. sent letters, but we got to move but forward. Again, that's the past, and we should, if we want to, if we want to try and create something new, uh, people speak of forgiveness and letting go all the time. I'm not a big... But it shouldn't be one time. It's always no, the first nation taking the high road. It's always the first nation taking the high road on these subject matters, and it gets exhausted, to be quite blunt. I agree. And knowing the inner with the whole story in this, it's pretty frustrating, but nevertheless, I'm going to spend my own net remaining five, six months on this term trying to bridge this relationship, and I don't see with with Brother Mike and his awesome council, and majority majority of our council are on board with the relationship. I can safely say that, and I'll leave it at that. My utopian mm. world would one day yeah. have the name of sitting table with the They should or minimally be at RDN. I think both myself. I think yeah. we should have a representative <laughs> but, of both. But anyways, but that's yeah. That's utopian <laughs> world. That's awesome, right? I appreciate that. We'll speak to municipal affairs about that, shall we? Is that who you would speak to? Who? Well, isn't, isn't it a provincial sort of decision about who gets to be on? Yeah, it's all, it's so, all the yeah. municipal, yeah. provincial, our, our steer us everywhere. Yeah. It's the rules we will fall under. Yeah. I wonder if the province would allow that to happen. I wonder if... Allow which to happen, sorry. To have uh, First, Nations First Nations sitting at the table. And and I wonder if a city actually... Where would you bring that well, up? Well, Qualicum First Nation, yeah. Chief, Chief Rick Helma sits at the table when uh, the chair, uh, Bill Wienhoff, not available. Michael uh, Chief McCalmus is, is, is regularly at the RDN. As he's a, he's the alternate up in their neck of the woods, up there. So. So maybe there is precedent for it already. I. It's different in a city. Possibly. Than possibly. I, there's always possibilities. Yeah. 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 Such a political answer, isn't that? <laughs> there's always possibilities. You have talked. This coming from the internet. You have talked about working towards that. Is there any plan? What exactly do you see as the path to reconciliation? The path to reconciliation. Wow, that's a good question. Out there, whoever asked that. Uh, hey, Miss Hamilton. Good question. The um, pathway to reconciliation starts off with the most basic things in relationship is about respect, acknowledging. And learning to live amongst each other. We're neighbors and we don't live amongst each other. And I'm in a dual role here because I'm a city councillor, Sanemo member, formerly on that council for 15 plus years, and really believe there's space. But we got to start off, for example, the master plan was a simple one the other night. And I believe, I'm not trying to be stuck there, I'm not stuck. But that's a simple one. That was a simple one where we could have said, you know what, let's sit down with Sanemo before we approve this master plan because the land's been sitting idle so long, I don't think a couple meetings would have hurt, in my view. But So that's a simple beginning. Uh, I think Blade, maybe we should bring in some cultural awareness or have uh, Reconciliation 101 for uh, council and staff and whoever, like we do in our offices. Uh, we're, we're, we do in our own in indigenous world, we do that. My new hires go through cultural awareness training and to learn the histories and the basics of colonialism. And a lot of people don't realize um, e um, there was an Indian hostel up beside the own army barracks, yeah. which was horrific. My late mom went there, and I don't want to get into that right now. I'll get too emotional. But nevertheless, we got to acknowledge and educate ourselves and create that space to educa edu educate ourselves. And politically, we have to 
do a lot better than what we're doing right now. Well, I says thank you very much for that. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. So that's five minutes for that discussion about okay. First Nations. So I think that would be another, another topic. But we only have four minutes to do it in. Another topic? Uh, okay, we're here. So I've got one. Quick question on the last one. Um, Ian's got one. Quick question relating to the last one. Okay. Is no, it's the name of She's the she's the moderator. Moderator. Wait a minute. Yeah. I think Marjorie decides. <laughs> so we're done with the five minutes on that yeah. discussion, yeah. so I'd like to do something new. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so can you can you propose a new? I'll ask you. Yes. A new question. Given the the wish to try and keep taxes low, mm -hmm. which a number of you are trying to push for that. And given that we have a homeless problem, and given that we have a transportation problem in this city, whether you are a driver of a car and you can't find a parking spot in your neighborhood, or whether you're a cyclist and you can't get around, and given that, that we have the Nanaimo Recycling Exchange, which of course is well supported by folks in this community, how on earth can we keep taxes down to that 2% level with all the extra monies that are being spent on unionized folks and on, uh, or on uh, the province now downloading one of its things to the city. How are we going to manage that on 2% when we have so many big needs that include poor people? Yeah, very uh, real question of the real issues today. Ian, I appreciate it. Um, I think we have to think of other revenue streams. Everyone says, oh, tax, 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 tax. Well, maybe some of our DCCs or um, door costs or new constructions aren't high enough. Uh, maybe we just got to get creative and realize we just can't, our only outlet can't even be the, the taxes. And I'm one of them that four years ago campaign on keeping the taxes in check and still do and, and uh, I'm just being real about it and the NRE conversation for the dollars requested was a very, unfortunately I believe it got too political where and couldn't even get a simple conversation of okay what's 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 dollars here what's the business plan and I know people sort of really well yeah it's the reality to this day it's never had that real conversation do i support recycling absolutely um transportation and housing problem well i think we got to create i'm gonna i'm touching my answer on housing i said one of the guys someone asked me behind there we've got to, if the city's taxpayer is going to fund a housing project that's not that's sort of offloaded from provincial government which are, we're getting really good at including the, the needle exchange stuff, but that's another conversation, is we got to create a housing that's affordable for people, and I totally have utmost respect and admire, and people that are better themselves going through treatment and all those other, going through the island health venue of housing, where you go from this stage to this, this stage. we got to create housing and be creative, whether it's lane housing or some form of density, or build our own micro units or something for the people that just can't afford it, that are out there working two, three jobs. We've got to ensure that demographic that sometimes unfortunately don't have the highest wages can get some too. We can't just, it's the, we got to continue in supporting what's happening today, but we also got to think bigger and support that. So now to answer your question about the taxes, well, I believe, very quickly. I, I believe there's enough still to this day to do enough with in, in, the, in the purse strings to uh, do this type of work. I wish I had more time to debate this or uh, give more solutions, my uh, opinions. You opened up to the table now. Okay. I will follow. Okay. For one more minute. Okay, you started it. Who wants to go here on the tax question? Tax question. Bill oh. made a statement about fiscal accountability. You want to Well, um, we talked about this to several of your um, the other councillors and the consensus is if you bring it down another one percent it's going to be service cuts and if you service cuts that means that uh, it's going to affect more people at the lower end of the socioeconomic status but having said that um, I like your idea of trying to create more revenue um, but my Concern is why is it 
you know, here we are, like a month to go. Because and, it's mining the surfaces. Yeah, and, and um, Tracy and Victor, in the middle of December, got the whole um, budget process going because they said they wanted lots of time for debate. Um, they didn't want any surprises. And here we are. Surprise! Surprise! Surprise. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, Fred, I'll, Fred, I'll be as quick as I can because that uh, is um, service cuts. I believe the service cut comments are made just a fear monger because what are service cuts? The city mandate stuff is going to happen. Last year we had a, um, I think one two point seven dollar two point two point seven tax increase and we had a $2.7 $2 million surplus. So to, to say, oh, you drive the taxes down, you're going to cut services? Absolutely ludicrous. You're going to have to work well, within. We'll see. I mean, um, what's going to get cut? I what, can what? tell you. Cycling infrastructure has been cut year after year after year. It's only just beginning to be put in now. That's one of the things that's been cut. And so now we have to pay millions of dollars more to extend the ENN line to go through those, those intersections because the money was not put into that when it was cheap. Well, that conversation is also the, the, the province in the, in the corridor holding us hostage for the ENN stuff. And actually, you know that. Actually, you well, know that. I, I don't and know that. Actually, all the money. And it's a proven fact, Bill, that when you cut taxes at the rate of a million dollars or, or more, or even $500,000, the people who pay the most for those cuts are the poor, the working poor, and the homeless. And because the first cut Where's that, that proven? Google. Or is that rhetoric? I will Google it. You Google. I've heard rhetoric on the other side too. Google. If you Google it, you can find Google. tons of scholarly articles. And you know I mean that respectfully. Yeah. Oh, I know you do. Awesome. Okay. No, I mean, I, I love educating myself, so that's what we're here for. And I love educating myself. Thank you, Rick. Oh, thank you. 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 Right? Hey, goodbye. You guys rock. Oh. Well, hey, you guys deserve to watch too. I want to take an opportunity to remind people that there are little programs here that have feedback forms on the back. No idea right now. One of the things that you really need is for you guys to fill this up. Tell us how to do this. And if you should do it again, let us any information so that we can do things like this and do them better in the future. Um, and uh, I think the other thing is that if you can go to the bathroom, clear us out because otherwise we'll end up taking the phone and have to make more. Thank you everyone for coming out. Have a great night. Hopefully we'll see you next time. Thanks for coming out. Absolutely.